Good afternoon, please be seated. <sighs> Routine proceedings. Uh, before routine proceedings, I have a statement uh, for the House. I would like to ask for the attention of all members for a brief moment. I've noticed that members are not always using the correct salutation or pronoun when asking questions or participating in debates in this House. When members are in this chamber, they are representing their constituents and should be free to do so in a respectful and inclusive environment. I've asked all members to refer to me as Honourable Speaker, and I'm asking again now for members to respect this decision. As well, when referring to your fellow members, I would ask that you please respect their personal pronouns and salutations. And I thank all members for your cooperation on this. Now, routine proceedings, introduction of bills. The Honourable... Is there somebody else who's introducing bill? The Honourable Minister of Transportation, Infrastructure, Consumer Protection, and Government Services. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I move, seconded by the Minister of Justice, that Bill 23, the Change of Name Amendment Act, be now read a first time. been moved by the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, Consumer Protection and Government Services, seconded by the Minister of Justice that Bill Number 23, the Change of Name Amendment Act 2, be now read a first time. The Honourable Minister of Transportation, Infrastructure, Consumer Protection and Government Services. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I am pleased to introduce Bill 23, the Change of Name Amendment Act. The bill makes changes to the current legislation to prohibit a person from being able to legally change their name if that person is convicted of a sex-related criminal offense or other serious criminal offense that is specified in the regulations. This bill requires all change of name applications to include a certified criminal record check in addition to the existing requirement of fingerprinting. These amendments align with government's commitment to building safer communities. The amendments also align Manitoba with other jurisdictions who have passed similar legislation. <laughs> Further introduction of bills? Oh, is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. I move, seconded by the Minister for Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care, that Bill Number 24, the Intimate Image Protection Amendment Act, distribution of fake intimate images, be now read a first time. It has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Justice, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care, that Bill Number 24, the Intimate Image Protection Amendment Act, be now read a first time. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Honourable Speaker, I am pleased to rise in the House today to introduce for first reading Bill 24, the Intimate Image Protection Amendment Act. This bill will expand the definition of intimate image to capture images created or, or altered by electronic means and update the title of the act. By expanding the definition, victims who have had computer generated or altered intimate images distributed without their consent will have access to the civil remedies provided for under the act. These amendments will also act as a deterrent for would-be distributors of electronically altered or created intimate images. 
While other jurisdictions, such as British Columbia, New Brunswick, and Saskatchewan, have brought forward similar legislation, these amendments to the Intimate Image Protection Act will make Manitoba a leader in protecting and supporting victims. I'm pleased to present this bill to the House for consideration. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed and so ordered. Further introduction of bills? The Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I move, seconded by the Premier of Manitoba, that Bill Number 22, the Celebration of Nigerian Independence Day Act, be, be now read a first time. It's been moved by the Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care, seconded by the Honourable First Minister that Bill No. 22, the Celebration of Nigerian Independence Day Act, Commemoration of Days, Weeks and Months Act amended, be now read a first time. The Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care. Honourable Speaker, this bill would amend the Commemoration of Days, Weeks and Months Act to designate October 1st as Nigerian Independence Day. October 1st is a meaningful day to Nigerians, as on that day in 1960, Nigeria freed itself from decades of British colonial rule that had disrupted the culturally diverse and distinct social structures of the peoples living in the territory. Manitoba is home to a thriving, dynamic community of Nigerian communities, Canadians rather, with a strong and significant involvement in the economic and cultural fabric of our province. This bill uplifts all those in the Nigerian community in Manitoba who advocated so we can be here today and to inspire future generations to be proud of who they are. Thank you. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed and so ordered. Committee reports, tabling of reports, ministerial statements, and I would uh, advise that the 90 minutes required has been provided. The Honorable Minister of Environment and Climate. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. This Sunday will mark the inaugural Ducks Unlimited Canada Day here in Manitoba a day to lift up the decades-long work of Ducks Unlimited and their tireless efforts to conserve, restore, and manage wetlands and associated habitats to benefit waterfowl, wildlife, and people. In the early 1930s, waterfowl populations were declining across the prairies, a trend driven by rampant habitat destruction and unsustainable hunting practices. It was in 1938 that waterfowl hunters from across the country came together in Manitoba to see what could be done. By pooling data collected by volunteers and citizen scientists, many of whom were hunters, Ducks Unlimited Canada began studying ways to preserve waterfowl habitats. They developed a system to ban waterfowl populations to better understand shifts in migration patterns, home range, habitat use, and nest site selection. With its first successful project at Big Grass Marsh, just west of Sandy Bay First Nation, and a head office in the Bank of Hamilton building here on Main Street, Ducks Unlimited Canada was ready to spread its wings. Over the next few decades, Ducks Unlimited would expand its operations to include major watershed engineering projects alongside the agricultural sector and initiate international cooperation programs, including the 1986 North American Waterfowl Management Plan between Canada, the United States, and later Mexico. In 1993, Ducks Unlimited Canada found a new home at Oak Hammock Marsh, where it remains today. Over its 85 years of operation, Ducks Unlimited Canada has completed nearly 12,000 projects on more than 200 million acres of habitat. Its decades-long conservation work has helped find solutions to flooding, drought, water pollution, and the impacts of climate change. Through it all, Ducks Unlimited Canada advances reconciliation through conservation and currently supports three Indigenous protected and conserved areas alongside the conservation through Reconciliation Partnership and Indigenous Leadership Initiative. Our Manitoba government commits to the ongoing protection, conservation and revitalization of Manitoba's lands and waters, working alongside partners like Ducks Unlimited Canada and the Seal River Watershed Alliance. 
Together, we will protect 30% of Manitoba's diverse ecosystems by 2030 and usher a new day for environmental stewardship in Manitoba. I want to wish everyone a happy inaugural Ducks, Un uh, Ducks Unlimited Canada Day and invite all of my colleagues to recognize the Ducks Unlimited Canada staff and board who are here today with us in the gallery and request to have their names added to Hansard. We have Michael Nadler, Mark Francis, Roger Deschambeau, Colin Robinson, and Trent Reno. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Swan River. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I am so pleased to rise in the House today to celebrate the Ducks and Limited Canada Day that is taking place this Sunday, March 17. It was my honour to introduce this bill in the House last year and to celebrate the partnership between this province and Ducks, as well as all groups that make this important work possible by recognizing March 17, which was the day that Ducks became an organization in Canada. Ducks Unlimited Canada is a passionate community of people who believe that, the, that nature is the foundation of strong communities, a prosperous economy and a sustainable future that supports the hopes and dreams of the next generation. Since 1938, volunteers and hunters have been working to grow this important conservation work. Hunters started and continue to support the movement that make the use of our wetlands in Manitoba possible. Not only do they work with land stewards across Canada, they're actively recognizing the importance of working with and building meaningful and mutual respectful relations with First Nation, Métis and Inuit peoples in protecting these natural systems we call home. Manitoba's wetlands are also an important factor when it comes to agriculture. They play a crucial role in supporting one another and allowing for sustainable farming. They have completed over 11,826 projects and conserved, restored, and positively influenced more than 201.8 million acres of habitat across Canada. Unfortunately, wetlands continue to be lost at an alarming rate. And that's why we must uplift and support Ducks Unlimited so that they can continue to provide the amazing work that they do. Thank you. Before I move on to further ministerial statements, I'd like to introduce some members we have in the gallery. We have with us in the public gallery, Nigerian community elders, who are the guests of the Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care, and we welcome you all to the gallery. We also have with us today, I'd like to draw the attention of all honourable members to the public gallery where we have with us today students from Elm Creek School, Claire Malenko, Mahida Veldman and Scarlett Friesen, who are the guests of the honourable member for Midland. On behalf of all honourable members, welcome. Further ministerial statements. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Addictions, Homelessness, and Men. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Addictions, Homelessness, and Mental Health. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I want and to start I by would advise the House that the required 90 minutes prior notice has been received. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I want to start by acknowledging folks in Manitoba across the country and the world who have been victims of human trafficking. I also want to uplift families and organizations who support the most vulnerable in our province each and every day. I want to acknowledge Victoria Morrison, a survivor of sex trafficking, who is brought here to Winnipeg. Victoria now shares candidly about her story of survival with the world to promote awareness and educate on the issue of human, human trafficking. According to Statistics Canada, nearly one in four victims of human trafficking is a child or youth, with 24% of victims being under the age of 18. 
Human trafficking transcends the crisis of MMIWG2S. It is important to note the disproportionate number of Indigenous women and girls who are affected by sex trafficking. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police has identified that Indigenous women and girls represent more than 50% of all human trafficking victims in Canada. My sister Claudette Osborne Tayo went missing on July 25th. 2008 in Winnipeg without a trace. Throughout the years, our family has often wondered whether she was a victim of human trafficking. My sister was 21 years old. Like many other families who have lost someone to, that has been missing, we've often wondered and have been left wondering whether they are victims of human trafficking. This issue of human trafficking and disappearance spans our nation from coast to coast to coast impacting children, families, and communities. This is not right. We as Manitobans, as Canadians, we must all do, some, do better. No one should be faced with this targeted violence. Honourable Speaker, human trafficking is a lucrative crime where pe perpetrators prey on the, vulnerable, on, on the vulnerabilities of their victims. Sophisticated, manipulative, Techniques are used to lure victims online or in person with barriers like poverty, trauma, precariously housed, housing, substance use, mental health, and other challenges that lead to our relatives being exploited. Victims are often lured and stripped of their decision making, then controlled by threats, cohesion, and manipulation. There are way too many victims here in our province and there is much work to be done to protect our relatives from this heinous crime. I want to recognize the work of our colleagues through the Tracia's Trust, which is Manitoba's sexual exploitation strategy. This strategy works across provincial departments and provides $15 million in funding to community organizations to prevent human trafficking. Trafficked persons can call the clinic human trafficking line for services and support. I, I encourage all Manitobans to call the Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline and visit cybertip.ca to learn more about the dangers presented by perpetrators and to, to report suspicious activity happening in their community. Each and every day, and especially on Human Trafficking Awareness Day, it is important that we continue to educate ourselves on the early signs of trafficking. I encourage all members in this House today to take the opportunity to remind other Manitobans, if you see something, say something. Our NDP government will continue to invest in healthy communities so that we can minimize some of the systemic vulnerabilities experienced throughout the province. It is up to all of us to keep our loved ones safe and extend this protection to everyone in our communities. Our government is committed to doing this work in collaboration with survivors, families, law enforcement, frontline organizations, all levels of government and the broader community. To the many survivors of human trafficking, we are now supporting each other, who are now supporting each other in their healing. We know that this is not easy and that you are doing incredibly hard lifting and important work. I want to uplift and honour you in all of the work that you do each and every day in creating awareness. You are warriors. Our community values you. We see you and we love you. Miigwech. The Honourable Member for Midland. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Today, March 14th, is an important day in Manitoba one that we have proclaimed as Human Trafficking Awareness Day. For years now, our province has dedicated this day to raising awareness and attention to the heinous practice of human trafficking and committing ourselves to ending it. Recently, the issue of human trafficking has become increasingly prominent and in turn more widely discussed as we recognize the reality that occurs both within our province and sadly within our country. This is a significant change because of the fact that for many years, many people were under, un, unaware of the severity of this issue and perhaps believed it occurred in some parts of the world, but not here. 
but the sad and unfortunate reality is that human trafficking occurs right here in Manitoba and often affects our society's most vulnerable populations disproportionately. Indeed, we know women account for 95% of sex trafficking victims, 43% which are young women ages 18 to 24. We also know that our Indigenous community is the most impacted population. We must take today to raise awareness of this issue and thank all the organizations who dedicate themselves to supporting victims, preventing trafficking, and advocating for policies that will utilize the full extent of the law to punish these predators. An example I'd like to recognize of such an organization is the Joy Smith Foundation, located right here in Winnipeg. The leading authority of human trafficking, this important foundation provides direct support for survivors uses education to empower all Canadians to stay safe, and works diligently to find justice and prevent trafficking from continuing in this country. Since its inception, the Joy Smith Foundation has helped over 7,000 human trafficking survivors and their families. Joy Smith is a former MLA for Fort Gary and former member of parliament for Kildonan St. Paul. Her passion and actions have made a difference for so many people in our country. She was the first sitting MP to amend the criminal code twice and strengthen sentencing for traffickers and expanding Canadian laws to reach internationally. Honourable Speaker, it is in witnessing the efforts of organizations like the Joy Smith Foundation that make today so important. By working together, we can ensure that awareness of human trafficking is continuously promoted Legislation is created that make it more difficult for predators to operate and support is provided to organizations to help victims, survivors and families. In closing, as we take today to discuss Human Trafficking Awareness Day, let us all remember that every day there are individuals in our cities, communities, province and across the country who are manipulated and trafficked. It will take a collective effort but we must not act now to protect people's right to freedom and liberty and work to bring an end to those crimes that devastate the lives of so many people each and every day. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kindle Park. Honourable Speaker, I ask for leave to respond to the Minister's statement. Does the Honourable Member have leave? Leave has been agreed. The Honourable Member for Kindle Park. Honourable Speaker, today I rise to speak to Human Trafficking Awareness Day. The Government of Canada defines human trafficking as the recruitment, transportation or harbouring of a person, including controlling or influencing their movements with the goal of exploiting or facilitating the exploitation of a person. This can take many forms, including sex trafficking, forced labour and domestic servitude. This dry definition is a statement of facts, but does not fully describe the horror and very human and traumatic costs that human trafficking incurs on victims. It is important to understand that trafficking is often very local and occurs here within our city limits. Honourable Speaker, the province says around 400 children and youth are trafficked annually in plain sight in Manitoba but it estimates that this is only a small portion of the illegal trade which operates in private and online. Human trafficking is difficult to detect and fight because all too often victims are coerced or shamed, preventing them from coming forward. Traffickers target vulnerable people and shamefully exploit them because of reasons including race, ability, immigration status, age and sexuality. Traffickers use manipulation as a means of maintaining control over their victims. This can include beginning a relationship through gifting expensive items or compliments, but quickly turns to emotional abuse, addictions, dependency, threats or violence. Honourable Speaker, in closing, and to build awareness for more information on human trafficking and resources, you can visit the Canadian Centre to End Human Trafficking website or report suspect, suspect, suspected human trafficking to the Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline. Thank you. Member statements. The Honourable Member for the Park Emmy Mr. Speaker, today I rise to honour the life of my young cousin, Austin Latham Bercier. Remembered as a brave hero, a caring friend, and a cherished son, Austin Latham Bercier was killed last November in combat with Russian forces. 
A proud member of a Pasquiat Cree Nation, Austin's dream was to serve in the armed forces. As a teenager, he participated in the Canadian Armed Forces Bold Eagle program and later the, Nav the Navy's Raven program. In the winter of 2022, a little over a week after Russia launched its, its invasion, Austin joined the International Legion for the Defense of Ukraine. Though his friends and family never fully understood his reasons, they all came to know that this was something Austin had to do. Driven by a fierce sense of justice and a calling to help anyone in need, Austin fought for what he knew was right. A few months later, Austin returned home to Manitoba to reconnect with his family and our nation's rich traditions. It was a time of great joy, but the war never left him. Upon hearing that two of his unit comrades had been killed in action, Austin's warrior spirit led him back to the front lines in the spring of 2023. He was only 25 when the Ukraine embassy called his parents to inform them that he had been lost to the war. His life stood for justice, integrity, bravery, honor, and the uncompromising need to see good done in our world. Austin is survived by his mother, Lucy Laughlin, and his father, Adam Bercier, and his siblings. Both his parents join us today in the gallery today. Honorable Speaker, I ask that you canvass the House for leave to observe a moment of silence in honor of Austin Laughlin, Laughlin Bercier. I go, sir. Is there leave for a moment of silence? Agreed. All rise, please. Further member statements? The Honourable Member for Midland. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. It is an absolute pleasure to rise in the House today to recognize and congratulate Team Hayward from Carmen, who are the 2024 Canadian Under-18 Curling Champions. And I'm pleased that they are here in the House with us today. I'd like to recognize Skip Shayla Hayward, 3rd Kira Cron, 2nd India Young, lead Riley Cox and coach Diane Hayward. Team Hayward is a U18 junior team that curls out of the Carmen Curling Club. Many of us proudly watched February 4th to 10th as the team headed to Ottawa for the U18 Canadian Nationals, making it to quarterfinals, semifinals, and lastly defeating Team Fortin from Quebec in the gold medal game. Eight wins and only two losses during the tournament. Team Hayward has made Carmen and the entire Manitoba curling community proud. The team has played together for five years, and all four girls are in their tw grade 12 year at Carmen Collegiate. In addition to their recent success at Canadian Nationals, Team Hayward are also two-time MHSAA Provincial Champs. The team went on to compete at the U21 Manitoba Junior Provincial Curling Championships at their home rink in Carmen. The girls won five wins and zero losses. Wow. Team Hayward is now heading to Fort McMurray next week to compete in the U21 Canadian Junior Curling Championships. I know I can speak for all members that we wish you all the best of luck. You continue to represent the Carmen Curling Club and all of Manitoba with pride. So I congratulate you on your recent successes and we'll all be cheering you on next week from here in Manitoba. Congratulations. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Riel. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Today I rise to honour Ecole Saint-Germain's Enviro Club, located in my constituency of Riel. 
The seed for the club was planted when music teacher Madame Engbrecht and her students collaborated on an environmentally themed concert. Their first performance was a resounding success and created momentum for further environmental initiatives at St. Germain and across our real community. Fueled by passion and creativity, the students joining us today have proven themselves to be environmental caretakers and valued partners in the fight against climate change. The students involved have created events like the Climate Change Symposium and an Environment Week to promote the everyday steps we can all take to create a sustainable world. These activities have given rise to initiatives such as litterless lunches, plastic bag drives, and a composting program at St. Germain. Through these programs, the club stays true to its roots by centering art and musical connection to the environment. The Enviro Club members often spend their free time at recess and lunch creating books, presentations, videos, and other performances to inspire the rest of the school to take environmental action, protect our ecosystems, and fight climate change. Having found a willingness to work at environmental sustainability among students, teachers, and parents at St. Germain, the Enviro Club has now been working to share their goals and solutions with their school division and other learning communities across the province. Enviro Club is an example of young people taking initiative and being role models to their peers and community at large. Change makers like them will help Manitoba find its strength and direction for the future. We can all learn something from the initiative of these bright young minds. Honourable Speaker, I ask everyone to join me in thanking the Ecole Saint Germain Enviro Club who are seated in the gallery for their determination and leadership on such an important cause. The Honourable Member for Springfield Rashad. In 1919, the inaugural conference of the Federated Women's Institutes of Canada was held right here in Manitoba and was presided over by Mrs. Emily Murphy, who realized the importance of organizing the rural women of Canada so they might speak as one voice for needed reforms. Murphy was not only the first president of the Women's Institute, but also one of, the, one of Canada's group of women known as the Famous Five. A monument honoring the famous five stands proudly on our Manitoba legislative grounds in recognition of their work, resulting in Manitoba women becoming the first in Canada to win both the right to vote and to hold provincial office. It is notable that, since its inception 100 years ago, the Women's Institute has remained true to its original mandate, which is to welcome all women regardless of their ethnic, religious, political, or educational background. While the women's institutes maintain themselves as a community-based organization for women, they are also part of an international organization that has members in over 70 country, countries. The Women's Institute is one of our Canadian organizations that enjoy royal patronage, and in 1953, the Dugald Women's Institute created a fashion show as entertainment for their provincial conference. This fashion show became famous and eventually became the Costume Museum of Canada with a royal visit from the late Queen Elizabeth II. The Dugald Women's Institute also won the Lady Tweedsmere competition for Canadian history with a hard copy history of the Springfield municipality published in, on the 100th anniversary of the municipality in 1980. Springfield Women's Institute has also accomplished numerous community projects and their biggest was their undertaking to erect a local monument on the 60th anniversary of the 1947 Dougal train disaster. It speaks not only to the disaster itself, but also to the compassion and heroism of the local people during this tragedy. Thank you to the Springfield Women's Institute for all you have done to make Manitoba a better place to live. The Honourable Member for the Maples. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. In 1972, Razman made the life-changing decision to settle in Winnipeg from Punjab, India, and faced the challenge of starting a new life. He worked tirelessly when he arrived, earning enough to support his family back home. In 1976, he married, and along with his wife, Kamaljit, they raised their young family, working factory jobs, night shifts to make ends meet. Mr. Mann followed his passion of music and arts by funding, founding the first local Punjabi radio and television program in Manitoba in the late 70s. 
He also traveled North America, gathering donations to help establish the Sikh city of Manitoba Gurdwara on Mallard Road. There he served as a president and executive member. His commitment to our community and the arts is evident in his radio and television programs, fostering a sense of belonging and unity within the Punjabi community while carving out their identity as a Canadian. I remember those Saturday evenings turning in to watch his TV program on video on Channel 11. Amazed that our community has this opportunity to showcase our heritage in Canada. Today, Mr. Mann is a proud father of two highly educated children and even prouder grandfather of three beautiful grandchildren. For over 50 years, recognizing the importance of preserving culture, heritage, providing a platform for Punjabi community, Razman's story as a proud Manitoba embodies the immigrants' experience of hard work, resiliency, and the pursuit of a better life. I would like to welcome Mr. Razman uh, with his uh, wife Kamaljeet and the family to the gallery today. Thank you, Mr. Honorable Oral questions. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. And before we get going to question period, Honorable Speaker, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, the Nigerian elders, uh, Team Hayward. Unfortunately, Ms. Bercy, I wish you were in the, in the gallery for other reasons today, but welcome here to the Manitoba Legislature. Of course, ducks and uh, a coal St. Germain. Honorable Speaker, seven of Canada's premiers are calling for a stop to the ca carbon tax April 1st. Manitobans saw them on the national news, but whose smiling face was missing? <laughs> this NDP premier has changed his position on the carbon tax more times than the weather changed in Manitoba's winter. Manitobans are calling on the premier to join other premiers and oppose the April 1st federal carbon tax hike. Will the Premier rise and explain his failure to act? The Honourable First Minister. I want to welcome the uh, Nigerian elders and members of the Nigerian community to your building. That's right. The People's Building yeah. of Manitoba. Right on. I want to extend the same congratulations to Team Hayward, to the folks from Ducks Unlimited, to all of our guests who are here today. And I want to speak directly uh, to Lucy. I wanted to put on the permanent record of this house the message that I've shared privately, which is that all of us as Manitobans are proud of your son's service. In the name of freedom, liberty, and democracy, we join you in mourning your loss. And as of one parent to another, you raised a good boy. May peace be with you. We're making life more affordable in Manitoba. We cut the fuel tax on January 1st, and inflation came down. We're going to continue working on behalf of you, the people of this province. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. The Premier failed to stand with other Premiers against the carbon tax and failed to stand up At first he said he was for all of us up. all Manitobans got a bromance. if this sounds familiar it's because he failed the same way in November Premier Houston of Nova Scotia led the charge calling for carbon tax fairness right across this country many premiers joined him as signatories of a letter to Justin Trudeau but our premier did not honorable speaker I now table a record from the government in Nova Scotia that proves that Manitoba NDP premier was invited to sign that letter not only did he fail to stand up for Manitobans, he failed to even respond. Wow. Wow. So I asked the Premier, wow. why didn't he Shame. or any of his many, many, many staff respond to that letter? Yeah, why? The Honourable First Minister. 
I'll ask the leader of the opposition a question I've asked many, many, many times. Why does he object to one fourteen cents a liter ca tax on gasoline yeah. when he charged another fourteen cents a liter tax on gasoline yeah. the entire time that he served in government? That we took immediate it. action. Yeah. We cut the PC yeah. gas tax fourteen cents a liter on January first, saving you and everyone across the province money. I really don't understand the policy direction of the Leader of the Opposition. In fact, he seems to be backing away from many PC, uh, PC election promises. During the election, they said they were going to stand firm yeah. against searching the landfill. But then in the Globe and Mail this week, he said he wasn't sure. After running and losing an election campaign on this topic, how does he not know his position? Yeah. Does he want to stand firm against the families of murder victims, or does he want to join us and the rest of the people of Manitoba to do the right thing? The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a final supplementary question. They're not happy, Bob. Once again, Honourable Speaker, deflection. Yep. Deflection. Yep. We still hear the cries of the protesters standing outside the legislature That's right. calling on this Premier to show up now that he's been re-elected. Lots of promises during the election says anything yep. to get re-elected, Honourable Speaker. Yep. If the Premier had raised this issue on the carbon tax with the federal government successfully, there would be evidence of the federal government walk, working towards a carbon tax exemption for Manitobans. We, request, we requested those records but received nothing, and I table that response now. What does this mean, Honourable Speaker? No records, no briefing notes, no we plan. Has Failing to stand up for Manitobans is nothing new for you know who, but this is just another flip-flop. Will he, I'll give him another yes, opportunity yes, to do the right thing, stand up for Manitobans today, call for a stop to the carbon tax today, prior to April 1st. Here, here, here. The Honourable First Minister. If standing up for Manitobans means saving them money at the pump, yeah. we did that on January 1st of this year. But what I don't understand about the member opposite is how after the PCs ran a very divisive campaign, he's chosen to double down on one piece of anti-trans rhetoric but then on the topic that was also very divisive and hateful, which was standing firm against the family of murder victims or whatever it was that their election ad said, he's now trying to backpedal away from that one. He told the Globe and Mail this week, the national newspaper of record, that he's not sure about whether we should search the landfill. I'm sure the member for Brandon West believes that when someone goes missing, that we should go looking for them. That's what we believe on this side of the House. Everyone else in Manitoba seems to understand that. Will the minister opposite, or member opposite, please clarify his position? And of course, if anyone wants to join the side of reason, you're more than welcome to cross the aisle. time has expired. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a new question. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The NDP Premier knows it's important to keep official separation between political staff and party staff. So why then did the Premier hire the President of the Manitoba NDP as his new Premier's Office Coordinator with a starting salary of $117,000, Honourable Speaker? The Honourable First Minister. I invite the uh, member for Lac du Body to share with Manitobans all the heads and officials from the PC party yeah. that their government hired yeah. during their time Table. in office. In fact, while we're talking about the failures of the PC party, let's talk again about the Stand Firm ad yeah. against the families of murder victims. It defies logic, it defies compassion that anyone would choose to attack grieving families like that. And yet, apparently, all the money that was fundraised by the members opposite was used to bankroll these ads. Now, even though they really doubled down on that strategy and lost government in part because of it, this week, the member opposite says that he's not sure where he stands on the issue. I think any reasonable person would have established an opinion on this topic. I'm simply asking the member for lack of body to tell us where he stands. Does he stand firm with the member for Tuxedo, or is he with us and the people of Manitoba? Yeah, that's right. 
The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, and it seems that uh, the interim Premier of the, uh, of the province is, is looking to look to get back to question period, Honourable yeah, Speaker. Yeah. There are rules that govern what we do here in Manitoba Legislature as legislators. Then there are rules that govern what we do outside of the Legislature as political parties. And then there are rules in, that preclude us from mixing those activities here in this great place. Is the Premier and the NDP leader following those rules? No. No, yeah. The Honourable First Minister. We always follow the rules, unlike the member for Tuxedo. Unlike the member for Tuxedo, who had to go to court and was told by a judge that she broke the rules. That's right. But again, you know what breaks the rules of polite society is running ads attacking the families of murder victims, arguing that standing firm against the landfill search was somehow a positive message is not something that I think reasonable people in this province support. We've been very clear. If someone in Manitoba goes missing, we should go looking for them. They've made clear under the member of Tuxedo's time where they stand. I'm simply asking the member for Lack of Body to tell the people of Manitoba, does he oppose the landfill search or has he now moderated his view? Yeah. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a final supplementary question. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And the Premier is, is standing firm on doing nothing. Yeah. 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 Honourable Speaker, I want to be clear. This is not an issue of staff. We all recognize that committed Manitobans who work alongside elected officials to serve Manitobans. This is an issue of the Premier expecting Manitoba taxpayers to foot the bill to pay his party president two and a half times the average salary in Manitoba. Shame paying yeah. his party officials more than most elected officials in this room. Yeah, right. So yeah. I asked the Premier, does he think it's appropriate to pay his political party officials with taxpayer funds? Wow. Yeah. 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 Good the Honourable First Minister. You know, the member for Lactabani really ought to tell the people of Manitoba about the lobbying activities of Marnie Larkin, yeah. who ran that hate-filled election campaign and talked the uh, members opposite, under the direction of the member of Tuxedo, to support those terrible landfill ads. I would invite the member now, after telling the Globe and Mail that he's not sure, even though his political party said that they wanted to stand firm against the landfill search, whether he believes in standing firm against the families of murder victims, or has he now moderated his opinion? Every person in Manitoba, whether they supported the surge or not, found that that ad campaign was mean-spirited. Right. Will the member stand in his place today and apologize for those ads? Yeah. Sure. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Honourable Speaker, this Premier obviously has no idea where he is. Maybe he's getting ready to get back on the opposition benches in 2027. He's supposed to answer the questions. He is the Premier. At the end of this month, the price of gas is going up 17 cents on carbon tax. Two months later, 14 cents on the gas tax. Between Justin Trudeau, Jake Mead Singh, and this NDP government and this Premier, 31 cents on your gas. Yesterday, this Premier said he won't join the other seven Premiers across Canada, across party lines, to stand against Justin Trudeau and the carbon tax. Why won't he stand up for Manitobans today and ax the tax? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Our team is very proud to be bringing greater affordability for all Manitobans with our fuel tax holiday. Yes. For her. That's right. <laughs> Cheapest gas in the country, lowest inflation in Canada for two months in a row. That's what our new NDP government is bringing to Manitobans. The previous government charged fuel taxes on Manitobans every single day they were in government for seven years. We're doing different. We're making life more affordable, more work to do. Can't wait to announce more on April 2nd. Here we go. The Honourable Member for Fort White on a supplementary question. Honourable Speaker, it's quite ironic and actually funny that the Minister stands up and talks about affordability. Manitobans for affordability. Yeah. I table this document, Honourable Speaker, 
As a Manitoban, you'd want your minister to talk to the federal minister of finance about affordability. And I'll table this document. All correspondence and records are discussing regarding the carbon tax between finance minister Christia Freeland and Manitoban minister Adrian Sala. There are none. Order, please. It's a well-known rule in this house that we don't use a member's name, either refer to him by his ministerial title or his constituency name. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Thank you, uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And I, and I apologize to the Minister of Finance for uh, mentioning his name in there. But in this document I'm going to table today, it's going to say, a thorough search of records under the control show that there was no records relevant to your crest at all. The question is simple. Why has the Finance Minister not had one correspondence with the Federal Member's Minister time Finance has expired. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. You know, as I've mentioned before in this House, we've had uh, a great series of engagements with Manitobans over the last couple of months doing our pre-budget consultations. And one of the main things we heard in those consultations was the great affordability challenges that Manitoba has suffered for seven years under this previous government because they failed to take action to make life more affordable. What did we do right out of the gate? We made a fuel tax holiday. We're making life more affordable. We're action. They're about inaction. Honourable Speaker, we're going to keep making life more affordable. More good news to come. The Honourable Member for Fort White on a final supplementary question. Honourable Speaker, not one correspondence with this finance minister and the federal finance minister are making life more affordable for Manitobans. That's what Manitobans need to know. The gas tax is going to go up on July 1st. The carbon tax is going to go up on April 1st. This Premier had the opportunity to join seven other Premiers across Canada and axe the tax. 70% of Canadians oppose the carbon tax. 70% of Premiers oppose the carbon tax. Why won't this Premier or Finance Minister do anything to make life more affordable for Manitobans? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Finance. The previous government did everything in their power to make life more expensive for Manitobans. They raised hydro rates in every creative way imaginable. They brought in legislation during the holidays in a pandemic which raised hydro rates through legislation for the first time in our province's history. That's their record. They raised taxes on renters, that's seniors, folks with disabilities. That's their record. What's our record? Making life more affordable. We're going to do more of it. More to come April 2nd. The member for Fort White, the speaker, is standing. So, you're cutting into your own time for questions. The honourable member for Midland. When this premier proposed his temporary gas tax holiday, he said he would, quote, put grocers on notice, quote, and that shoppers would see immediate savings. Unfortunately for Manitobans, this did not happen. Anyone who saw savings at the grocery checkout found them by being frugal, shopping deals and coupons, not because of this Premier. He promised if we don't see those savings materials materialize, then that's when we're going to follow up on those further steps. So I ask him, what further steps has he taken and what grocers has he met with to address these pricing concerns? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker, and it's always a good question to uh, deal with the price of food. Obviously, the members opposite really didn't have any conscientious feeling where they didn't consider about during their seven and a half years of government to take 14 cents off a litre to That's make right. life affordable That's for right. people. Obviously, the, the price of groceries, and we've been in consultation with the Federal Agriculture Minister about the price of food, and I think the members opposite maybe should have taken the initiative when they were in government. They waited until we got elected to do their work for the benefit of the honourable member for Midland wow. on a supplementary question. Order. 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 Order.
Speaker, we know this NDP government is trying to hide the promises it has made. When you go to the NDP's own website to look at their promise for a better deal at the checkout for Manitobans, all you see is the page you're looking for was not found. That is because due to the fiscal mismanagement of this NDP government, the savings Manitobans have been looking for are not found. I table this page from the NDP's own website and simply ask, why is he hiding the plan he promised to Manitobans? I would remind the members that order, 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 thank you. I would remind the member that using props while they're speaking is not allowed, so please refrain from doing that, all of you. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. Maybe I should suggest Maybe uh, ink, uh, our cartridges run out. Maybe that's why she couldn't get her yeah, right down on a piece of paper. But honestly, Minister, we talk about the price of food. We talk about the price of food, the grocery code of conduct. But you know what? Why is the government who sat across had no conscientious feeling about the price of food None. when they brought in a 300% increase in Cromland leases for agriculture producers? Oh, yeah. They also double billed producers the same year. I asked the members opposite, were you conscientious what the price for those producers were in that year to be double billed and 300% increase in their lease rates in the long run? Right on, right. Laser the Honourable Member for Midland on a final supplementary question. All talk and no action. This is this theme of this NDP government and the Premier. Maybe the next time the Premier hires someone to ghostwrite a book, I suggest he try the title The Reason I Talk, since that all he does. When this Premier makes his pledge, retailers and experts told him the economy doesn't work this way, but the Premier ignored them and sold Manitobans the bill of goods. Why does this Premier deceive Manitobans and pre pretend and promise action he has no intention to take? Yay! The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. And this is not uh, old news. This is the new news. We've got, we've got the number one premier in Canada. So, so I, that's right. So I had it wrong. So I beg to differ with the conscientious feeling for the member opposite asking the question that the Premier is not accountable. I think all of Canada realizes what we have today in the province of Manitoba. It's too bad the members opposite don't realize that. The Honourable Member for Portage La Prairie. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. I want to let everybody know I didn't get this information off the interweb. I spoke earlier this week about the crisis of animal welfare and overpopulation in our province. In the campaign, and again more recently, the NDP stated that they would establish mobile spay and neuter clinics to address dog overpopulation. The One Health program started in 2022 is funded in part by a $750,000 commitment from, this, from the PC government. Why reinvent the wheel? All he needs to do is increase and extend the already existing funding to Winnipeg Humane Society. Will the minister commit today to increase and extend the term of funding for One Health Members or will he end The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker, and, and thank you for the questions, members opposite. Definitely, we've noticed a large increase of animal cases in the province of Manitoba and across Canada. Manitoba is not unique in the moving forward on this situation. Last week, we had a chance to sit with the Winnipeg Humane Society Board of Directors, and we're starting to work towards what is the alternative of choices? Dollars are the important spade and neutering programs continue to happen in northern Manitoba, and we will continue to work with those organizations to make life more adaptable for our poor animals that are suffering right now in today's society. Good job, man. Right on. 
The Honorable Member for Portage the Prairie on a supplementary question. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. When asked previously about One Health funding, the Honourable Minister mentioned funding of $150,000. He showed very little knowledge of the program at the time. He couldn't even name the group that he met with. We already knew there was a problem and we got start work for fixing it. On this side of the House, we recognize the crisis in animal overpopulation. We committed to doubling provincial funding for One Health and extending the term. Will the Minister of Agriculture be copying another PC plan by increasing the funding to One Health? Great question. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. And as I want to repeat what I had mentioned a few days ago about the program, in 2003, we had uh, 1,737 animals were seen in 23 communities, in which 1,198 were spayed and neutered and implanted with various programs. We continue, we continue to work with people throughout the province of Manitoba. And I want to assure you, as an agriculture producer that works with numerous animals and had an opportunity, my heart goes out to all the animals that have been left neglected. And, and being treated the way they are, we as this government will continue to work with the Winnipeg Humane Society and anybody else that chooses to be Remember protecting time the animals. Expired. The Honourable Member for Portage La Prairie on a final supplementary question. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The NDP are bringing back a recycled ag minister. Maybe they're bringing back failed ag policies as well. Like the disastrous hog barn moratorium. Maybe the health of hogs are not an issue with them. Animals of all kinds, cats, dogs, cattle, iguanas, all deserve care. Our government provided 33% increase to vet training seats available to Manitobans. I know this was near and dear to the MLA for boroughs. Will the minister commit to continuing efforts and funding additional vet training seats? Yes or no? Here, here. Oh. The Honourable First Minister. Order. 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 I shouldn't have to ask three times. And again, you're cutting into your own time. Even when I'm standing up speaking, the clock is running, so keep it up. You're just losing time. The Honourable First Minister. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I really appreciate the tone of compassion that uh, our agriculture minister showed, because that's where the people of Manitoba are at. Manitobans are compassionate people. They want to see animals treated with dignity and with respect, and we are working to meet the good work in the community. But I am compelled to stand up when the members opposite go beyond answering questions in good faith and start to make personal attacks, start to make invective included into the questions that they pose. So any time a member of our team is attacked on a personal level, I will get up and stand up and call the members opposite to order. You're free to ask questions in good faith about substantive issues. Our team is happy to respond, but we've got each other's backs 100 percent. We'll answer the shots every time, and we'll keep doing the good work on behalf of the people of Manitoba. The Honourable Member for Spruce Woods. The absolute hypocrisy in that statement is mind-boggling, but nonetheless, seven out of ten, seven out of ten, that's how many provincial premiers are publicly calling on Justin Trudeau to stop his offensive and misguided 23% increase in the carbon tax on April 1st. Can this premier explain why he isn't one of them? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to stand in this House and talk about the important work our team is doing to make life more affordable for Manitobans. We brought in a fuel tax holiday already right out of the gate. There's more work to do. What we're not going to do is raise the cost of living like the members opposite did for seven years when they were in government. Here, here. The 
Honorable member for Spruce Woods on a supplementary question. I'll table an image of all seven premiers just to remind the premier what they look like. These are his colleagues that he sat down with in Halifax, looked in the eye, and said, yes, I'll support you in asking for fairness on carbon tax exemptions, only to walk it back as soon as he got back to Manitoba. Will he flip-flop again today, do the right thing, join the vast majority of provincial premiers in calling Justin Trudeau for a pause in his tax hike, or do the NDP believe Manitobans need a 23% increase in their carbon tax right now? The Honourable Finance Minister. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I want to remind the critic, every single day they were in government, every single day for seven years, that party applied the fuel taxes to Manitobans. They had an opportunity every day that they were in government for seven years to make life more affordable. And now they're coming forward with all types of big ideas, but they failed to take action. They failed. We're taking action. We're making life more affordable, Honourable Speaker. The Honourable Member for Spruce Woods on a final supplementary question. It's clear this NDP crew thinks the carbon tax is great. When the Premier's away from his caucus, he commits to fighting it. But when he comes back home to his NDP colleagues, his opposition to the carbon tax melts away. Can the Premier make it clear today, if the federal government should change and remove a national carbon tax, will this government follow on British Columbia's footsteps and impose one of its own? The Honourable Minister of Finance. We're making life more affordable, Honourable Speaker, which is the opposite of what that party did in seven years when they were in government. That's right. They raised costs on farmers by raising the cost of their Crown leases. They raised taxes on renters, Honourable Speaker, by $150. And they raised hydro rates over and over and over again. We're making life more affordable, more work to do, more good news on April 2nd when we release our budget. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Just over an hour ago, hundreds of young people stood outside the Manitoba Legislature asking for our help. Many have joined us today in the gallery. I am asking the Premier to understand the urgency of this matter. These young people need our help, and this government has the ability to help them. Honourable Speaker, will the Premier commit today to making sure that these young people receive their provincial nominee certificates before they lose status and are forced to leave our country? The Honourable First Minister. Manitoba is a great place to grow up. It's a great place to grow old. And we want more people to join this province, yeah. set down roots here, and build their lives here. That's right. That's right. There are a lot of tears being shed. There is a lot of stress being visited on people in our province because the federal government is cancelling postgraduate work permits. I want to make a personal commitment that our Shh, immigration minister is going to work with people who are here in the province to find solutions. That's right. Our goal is to keep people in Manitoba, in Manitoba, working for generations to come. We have an open door. Let's work together to ensure that we can have a prosperous future together on these lands. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park on a supplementary question. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. These individuals who have joined us today are well aware that it is ultimately up to this provincial government that will determine whether they are able to stay here in Manitoba or not. So what is this government prepared to do to make sure that these young people receive a certificate before they are forced to leave our country? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Immigration. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and uh, thank you, Member Opposite, for raising this very, very important issue. Actually, over lunchtime, I, I was able to meet with a few of the uh, protest leaders, including MD, Jassan, Rahal, Shilu, Tenyu, and even Verinder. Um, 
I really appreciate the fact that uh, they were able to express themselves politi politically like this and to participate in, in this discussion. And um, it's part of our democracy that's really, really important. Um, another thing is that our government is very sympathetic to people who want to make Manitoba their home. And we're going to be working together with all these folks to make sure that we're going to Minister's be creating time a path expired. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park on a final supplementary question. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I'm asking that the Government of Manitoba stand in support of our international students who chose to come to Manitoba in good faith. They invested thousands of dollars in their education. They have taken upon jobs that support our economy. And we're talking, this is two, three, four years, Honourable Speaker, they have been here contributing to our province, paying taxes. These are some of our most highly skilled Manitobans. Will this government ensure that nominee certificates are issued in a timely fashion and allow for them to stay in Manitoba? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Immigration. Honourable Speaker, the federal government in December and in January made the decision to, to stop um, extending the federal work permits for these folks. We are going to be working on a solution along with the federal government to help ensure that these folks can continue to work here in Manitoba and contribute to our province because we really need them. Due to the PC cuts on my second day on the job, Manitoba lost 2,000 newcomer spots. Order. A member shouldn't have to scream at the top of their lungs to be heard in this chamber. So please tone it down a little. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Immigration. Due to the PC cuts, our provincial department wouldn't even be able to process the applications of those 2,000 folks that we just missed out on. The member's time has expired. The Honourable Member for Kildonan River East. Honourable Speaker, the Minister of Justice has been hard at work bringing forward many pieces of legislation. He has continued meeting with stakeholders on public safety. I know he will continue being tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime. There is a growing risk to everyone, especially kids, around artificial intelligence and specifically AI-generated intimate images. Would the Minister of Justice tell us about the legislation he is bringing forward to protect Manitobans, especially kids, from the dangers of artificially generated intimate images? Good question. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Honourable Speaker, uh, I know the member for Kildona River East has worked with high school students in her past. She's a proud mom. And so she, like all members in this chamber, know how important it is to keep our kids safe online. It's essential for parents, for governments to act swiftly and as technology evolves it becomes important that this legislature bring forward important bills like the one we brought forward today to bring us back to the forefront of protecting kids and anyone who has intimate images that are dis distributed against their will. AI and altered images are becoming more and more of an issue. As parents, as legislators, I hope we can come together, we can move forward, and Minister, we can protect time everybody. Expired. The Honourable Member for Roblin. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Yesterday, while scrumming with the media, the Minister of Health falsely claimed that no funding had been cut by the NDP government for the Filipino health care worker recruitment program. So I'll table a media article from December where the Premier and Finance Minister clearly lay out $5.8 million in cut funding. Why did the Minister try to conceal this yesterday? Or were they just not aware of the funding their government cut three months ago? Wow. I'm thinking. The Honourable Minister for Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care. Honourable Speaker, staffing the health care system is a top priority for our government, including welcoming those from the Philippines who want to become of our 
become a part of our healthcare team here across the province in Manitoba. Uh, the member opposite has two former failed PC health ministers in her own caucus. She could have asked them about that program and where they went wrong. The dollars she's referring to are lapsed funds that were underutilized because their program has failed to, to achieve their own targets set to achieve July of last year. So perhaps she has two former ministers she could pose that question to her in her own caucus and get some answers. Right yeah. on. The Honourable Member for Roblin on a supplementary question. Yesterday I tabled documents concerning a group of Filipino nurses who are willing yeah. to come to Manitoba yeah. today under this NDP health minister yeah. and they're being blocked. Wow. Yeah. And yesterday while scrumming they're with the media, the, right the minister made it clear that they think I should have brought this issue to their office and not to question period. <laughs> but this is concerning. Because not only did these nurses go through the proper channels, only to be held up for months due to shared health having talks with the government, but the minister's statement implies that newcomers wanting to work in Manitoba should only reach out directly to the minister, instead of being supported through the immigration process. So can the minister confirm, does every newcomer wanting to come and work in our health care system have to email them directly? Or will the NDP government finally actually put forward a plan to train, recruit, and retain health care time has expired. The Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care. Honourable Speaker, just so that we are all clear, the member opposite is stating for the House that the program her previous government developed is not only wildly underperforming, but she's standing up in the House and demanding that I fix the mess her government made previously. Now, Honourable Speaker, I am going to continue to do the work of cleaning up the mess in health care the previous government made. And I want to make it explicitly clear, that member opposite knows fully well that on this side of the House we support all health care workers to be a part of our health care system, including those who want to reside here in Manitoba from the Philippines. We're going to do the work every single day cleaning up the mess in health care the previous government made and making health care stronger for all Manitobans. Right on. The Honourable Member for Roblin on a final supplementary question. The NDP also said in the Winnipeg Free Press today, and I quote, no immediate changes are being considered to make it easier for Filipino healthcare workers oh, offered jobs shame. in Manitoba. Shame. Yet in February, the Minister of Immigration said in an article that I'll table that they were developing a new path of accreditation for internationally educated nurses, and that includes the CCA exam that impacted this group of Filipino nurses. Yeah. What is it? it sounds like changes are being considered, but it's very confusing. And healthcare workers wanting to work in Manitoba are confused, and we can all tell the NDP cabinet is confused. So will the minister please clarify for the House, are they working on the new accreditation or not? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care. Honourable Speaker, it is very clear, it is becoming abundantly clear that the confused person in this House is actually the member opposite. And I'm really concerned about that because we're talking about a program that was developed by the previous government and if she has questions she needs answers to, guess what? Two failed former health ministers are sitting on that side of the house with her. Honourable Speaker, every single day, we are creating stronger pathways for internationally educated healthcare workers. We are making sure that we're cleaning up the mess in healthcare the previous government made. And we are taking step the pre steps the previous government never did. That's treating healthcare workers with respect, right. building the healthcare workforce in Manitoba, right. and making sure Manitobans have the healthcare they can count on. The time for oral questions has expired, and I have a statement for the House. Uh, please, uh, can all members be aware of electronic devices, earpieces, and speaking notes close to the microphones on their desks, and ensure that they are moved away when they are recognized to speak. The feedback can damage the hearing of those wearing headsets and providing uh, simultaneous interpretation, and also those in Hansard transcribing what has been said. Again, I ask for your cooperation on this, and it would be very much appreciated for all the staff who support us here in all we do. 
Thank you. Petitions. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Honourable Speaker, I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this petition is as follows. Number one, the federal government has mandated a consumption-based carbon tax with the stated goal of financially pressuring Canadians to make decisions to reduce their carbon emissions. Number two, Manitoba Hydro estimates that even with a high efficiency furnace, the carbon tax is a costing and the, costing the average family over $200 annually, even more of those for those with older furnaces. Number three, home heating in Manitoba is not a choice or a decision for Manitobans to make. It is a necessity of life with an average of almost 200 days below zero degrees Celsius annually. Number four, the federal government has selectively removed the carbon tax off of home heating in the Atlantic provinces of Canada, but has indicated they have no intention to provide the same relief to Manitobans heating their homes. Number five, Manitoba Hydro indicates that natural gas heating is one of the most affordable options available to Manitobans, and it can be cost prohibitive for households to replace their heating source. Number six, Premiers across Canada, including the Atlantic provinces that benefit from the decision, have collectively sent a letter to the federal government calling on it to extend the carbon tax exemption to all forms of home heating with the exception of Manitoba. Number seven, Manitoba is one of the only provincial jurisdictions to have not agreed with the stance that all Canadians' home heating bills should be exempt from the carbon tax. Number eight, provincial leadership in other jurisdictions have already committed to removing the federal carbon tax from home heating bills. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows, to urge the provincial <laughs> government to remove the federal carbon tax on home heating bills for all Manitobans to provide them much needed relief. This petition is signed by Ryan Poirier, Rowan Wachenko, Sebastian Klaprat, and many other fine Manitobans. Honourable Speaker. Are there any further petitions? Seeing none, grievances, orders of the day, government business, the acting house, the okay. acting government house leader. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Can you please call to resume debate on all stages of interim supply? It has been announced that we will resume debate on all parts of interim supply. Resuming debate on second reading of Bill 35. Bill 25, sorry. The Interim Appropriation Act of 2024, standing in the name of the Honourable Member for Interlake Gimli. Uh, my mistake, standing in the name of the Honourable Member for Midland, who has 24 minutes remaining. Opposition House Leader on House Business. Honourable Speaker, could you please canvas the House to see if there is leave to call the time as 5 p.m. As soon as Royal Assent uh, is completed, the ceremony for Bill 25, the Interim Appropriation Act 2024 has finished. Is there leave to not see the clock until Royal Assent has been granted to Bill 25, the Interim Appropriation Act 2024? I hear a no. My mistake, wrong, wrong leave request. Is there leave to have the House call the time as 5 p.m. as soon as the Royal Assent ceremony for Bill 20? Order, 
Order. I'll start again. Is there leave to have the House call the time as 5 p.m. as soon as Royal Assent Ceremony for Bill 25, the Interim Appropriation Act 2024, has finished? I heard a no. Leave has been denied. The Honourable Opposition House Leader on House Business. Honourable Speaker, could you please canvass the House to see if there is leave to not see the clock until Royal Assent has been granted to Bill 25, the Interim Appropriation Act 2024? Is there leave to not see... Is there leave to not see the clock until Royal Assent has been granted to Bill 25, the Interim Appropriation Act 2024? Is it agreed? Agreed and so ordered. The Honourable Member for Midland. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I look forward again today to, some, to putting some words onto the historical record as it relates to the Interim Supply Appropriation Act. The NDP Cabinet, since being elected in 2023, have authorized the Finance Department and Treasury Division for the Government of Manitoba to significantly borrow additional funds over and above what has been the normal pattern of borrowing over the past eight years. We've asked why, and the Minister of Finance did not have an answer for that. The amount authorized totals almost $10 billion in borrowing since they have been elected in just a few short months. This is not normal, Honourable Speaker. What does this suggest? Well, this suggests something that we all know, us on this side of the House are prepared for it, but it will certainly come as a surprise to Manitobans. They plan to run large deficits for many years to come, despite, despite inflation and federal transfers going up significantly recently and since 2021. In addition, the NDP have added another $710 million in new spending above the 2023 budget that already had record increases from 2022. We need to focus on growing the economy and bringing in that revenue. Constant borrowing is not the answer. Yesterday I spoke about growth-oriented policies, that that's the answer. We need to encourage private sector investment in this province. That is what will create jobs. That's what will create a tax base. That is what will create revenue to the province of Manitoba. I spoke yesterday about how under the previous PC government, over 30 economic development projects were in process. Yet when the NDP came into power, what did they do? They fired the very person that was putting those projects through and encouraging that investment to come into Manitoba. That is shameful. Clearly, this shows where this NDP government stands, and that's against private investment, whereas us on the PC side of the House know that that is what improves our economy and drives our tax base and is better for Manitobans. The NDP must commit to fighting inflation, to repaying rather than growing debts. This is something our PC government understood. After the NDP depleted the rainy day fund in 2016 under strong economic conditions, and as I mentioned yesterday, Honourable Speaker, we know we don't have strong economic conditions right now. We are in an affordability crisis. We expect these challenges to continue. Manitobans are concerned about affordability. Canadians are concerned about affordability. Yet this NDP government does not seem to be concerned about affordability. The only affordability bill that they have introduced to date, Honourable Speaker, is a temporary 14 cents fuel tax pause that realistically only lasted two and a half weeks and is set to expire in June. And yet they refuse to commit to any other affordability measures for Manitobans. Asking Manitobans to provide even more money while they dig deeper and deeper into their pockets, well, I tell you, Honourable Speaker, those pockets are getting less and less. They are not providing the citizens of this province with any sense of security on how this government manages its money. And we all saw what happened in 2016, Honourable Speaker, when the NDP Selinger government left over $800 million in a deficit, depleted the rainy day fund, and that was in good economic conditions, because that's what this NDP government does. They tax and they spend. Or in this case, they're going to be spending and then they're going to be taxing. Generations. We do recognize that there are basic operations of governments that do need to continue, Honourable Speaker. And of course, this is what the interim supply bill is intended for. However, 
They have authorized to over $10 billion of new borrowing and debt since being elected in October. This is significantly higher than the previous borrowing that has happened over the past number of years. And again, the Minister of Finance could not say why they needed such an increase in borrowing. The government is coming forward and the Minister of Finance is coming forward and requiring once again to spend more money on the backs of Manitobans, money that Manitobans do not have. On the backs of higher interest rates, debt servicing costs are projected to increase and I will say this clearly, $263 million, totaling $1.28 billion this year alone. That does not even include Manitoba Hydro's debt service costs. Yeah. And we all know how the NDP likes to run hydro, Honourable Speaker. We saw it the last time they were in power. Billions and billions of dollars in debt on the backs of hardworking Manitobans. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, we saw the previous NDP government. They had an opportunity at that time to set money aside in the very good times that were realized in Manitoba during that period of time. But they showed their true colors, like the NDP always does. Tax and spend or spend then tax. And now we are headed into a very similar situation, and today and yesterday is no different. Expect the situation is instead not in good economic times because we are in an affordability crisis, Honourable Speaker. Economists are predicting we're heading even into more challenging times in Canada as a result of NDP Liberal coalition overspending, overborrowing, and placing debt on the backs of Canadians. Because the economy hasn't grown. You guys are With the rising costs of living and weakening economic conditions, life is increasingly unaffordable. And it's unfortunate the member opposite is heckling me when they very well know that their government fired the individual running economic development right. here yeah. in Manitoba. Yeah, with right. 31 and projects in president. process and, and investment president. coming here into this province. Yet we haven't seen an economic development plan. Nope. Do they care about the economy? The Do higher. they care about the growing revenues. jobs? Do they care about growing the tax base here in this province? It Here's certainly doesn't seem so, Honourable Speaker. Constituents, my constituents, are telling me that affordability is the number one issue. I hear them from my constituents, I'm hearing from Manitobans, I'm hearing from friends in other provinces all across Manitoba and people that I connect with. In December, a report was released by the Salvation Army showing one in four Canadians are struggling to afford rising costs of covering basic needs, food, shelter, and transportation. 21% of those respondents in that survey reported they have been forced to reduce food intake in order to afford groceries, often leading to only eating less than one meal a day. Parents are clearly struggling to put food on the table, and it's the most vulnerable members of our society that end up suffering the most. Data from an Angus Reid poll back in December indicated this is the number one issue Manitobans are faced with. But the NDP has shown their true ignorance when it comes to recognizing the struggles of average Manitobans. As mentioned, the 14 cent fuel tax temporary holiday that lasted two and a half weeks realistically is their only affordability measure to date. Food, shelter and transportation are basic necessities, yet the NDP continued to flip-flop on the NDP Liberal Coalition carbon tax set to increase on April 1st. We know that the carbon tax is baked into basic necessities. It is felt the most with the purchase of these basic necessities. Manitobans are going to have to find this money from somewhere. Where are they going to get it when the cost of living is so high and carbon taxes on our basic necessities are set to increase? The NDP government refused to remove home heating from Manitobans hydro bills, the carbon tax on home heating from Manitobans hydro bills, despite our neighbouring province of Saskatchewan doing just that. On January 1st, Premier Scott Moe removed the carbon tax from heating bills, providing significant and necessary cost relief to families in Saskatchewan. But here in Manitoba, while many families are struggling to make ends meet, the NDP government has chosen instead to do nothing. A recent ledger poll indicates 69% of respondents are not in favour of increasing the carbon tax. We on this side of the House recognise that the carbon tax is an unnecessary tax burden on Manitoban families. We know Manitobans are struggling to find the extra dollars for those basic necessities that I have already previously mentioned. 
Numerous reports, as I have mentioned in my remarks today, have indicated rising costs of our basic necessities are impacting the most vulnerable people. Recognizing the cost burdens on families are difficult. I'm a mom. I have two kids. I know how expensive things are. $35 for a car and a baby formula. $20 for a sweater that my son will grow out of in three short months. This is expensive for the average Manitoban. This would significantly help Manitoban families if the NDP came up with a solid, tangible, and long-term affordability yep. plan, not continuing to increase their borrowing costs and debt on the backs of Manitoban families. And the only answer that I have for them doing this is that they want to raise taxes on Manitobans. What's it going to be this time? An increase of the PST? Maybe an increase of tax on haircuts, manicures, pedicures, home insurance. They did it last time, they're School gonna tariffs. do it again. Birth School death. tax, birth and debt taxes. Wow, that was shameful that that previous shameful. NDP government had done where this Minister of Agriculture was sitting around the very cabinet table when that happened. He was. We on this side of the House recognize we must do more to support struggling Manitobans. And we know that borrowing and debt service costs are not the way to do it. Nope. From my constituents, it's common to hear, we're just living paycheck to paycheck. We're sacrificing. We don't have extras. Yet the NDP continue to borrow Manitobans and Manitoba Hydro further into debt while front-loading as much spending as they can into this fiscal year. Honourable Speaker, they have launched a March Madness spending campaign to try to reach their $1.6 billion deficit target. And then blame us. They are using advertisements to promote the PC government's tax cuts that were saving Manitobans families instead of coming up with their own affordability plan. Yeah, no We've seen them today take credit for our hard work and yeah. our bills. Yeah. That's what they do. Right. They are too busy yeah. doing TikToks during the day in order to come up with their own plan. This what? is what NDP governments do. They have reckless spending and reckless borrowing. They're clearly doing it again. Will they commit to not raising taxes on Manitobans? Because we haven't heard anything yet. We don't know yeah. their plan. Flip, flop, Manitobans whatever. don't, don't know their plan. It. But we certainly have an idea. Today certainly gives us an idea of what is to come into the future. An authorized $710 million in new spending for fiscal 23-24. This is the NDP's special warrant for match madness spending spree. This is a clear attempt to inflate the deficit to the NDP Minister of Finance's target of $1.6 billion. This means the NDP are spending billions more this year and will spend billions more next year, putting Manitoba further into debt. It means more of Manitoba's taxpayers will go to pay interest to Bay Street banks instead of government yeah. programs. Yeah. The NDP, with their $3 billion in election promises, are once again growing Manitoba's debt exponentially and completely out of, control. out of control. The PCs left the NDP with a surplus last year surplus. and a plan, plan to balance the budget by 2025. The NDP finance minister has personally revised the government's forecast of deficit in the second quarter. Really? Instead of the budgeted deficit of $363 million following last year's $270 million surplus, the NDP Looking now cool. plan to spend an additional $1.3 billion this fiscal year to reach their billion dollars deficit. After years of steady improvement by RPC government that led to two surpluses in 19 and 2022-23, the NDP are borrowing more to spend more yep. in their first six months That's of right. government. Yep. Manitoba does not have a revenue problem, Honourable Speaker. The NDP have a spending problem. Spend DP. The NDP are trying to change their channel from their failures and broken promises that they made during yep. this campaign. Broken promises. The NDP have neglected to mention they are in charge for half of this budget's fiscal year when all the final tough decisions have to be made by this government. The MNP report itself acknowledges economic growth has been better than expected for 2023 at 1.7%. So I ask this NDP government again why the significantly high borrowing costs over $10 billion that have been higher than the past number of years. The PCs 
knew they wanted to make life more affordable for Manitoban families. We invested in schools, highways, addressed health staff shortages. We managed these expenditures while also returning to balance. The NDP are failing to act on these priorities. We've seen them have no plans and no forward vision about how to fiscally manage this province properly. Instead, they are playing partisan games in an attempt to distract from their broken promises while desperately looking for someone else to blame. Right. Today is the NDP's preparation for their big show. The NDP is setting the stage to eventually ta hike taxes and cut services. We've seen it before and we will see it again, we Honourable again. Speaker. <clears throat> Just it has been almost six months, Honourable Speaker, six months, and this NDP government has barely moved any bills forward in the legislature. We have seen barely any affordability bills, and yet this is the number one issue facing Manitobans, number one issue facing Canadians. Multiple reports, polls, surveys have indicated this. So why is the NDP government not taking this seriously? Well, we certainly know why they're not taking it seriously, because they want to go and tax those Manitobans. That's what they're going to do. They are going to run three big canoe-sized deficits. Now let's talk about a canoe. It's what, 16 to 18 feet long? That's about three of me? Well, that's a lot of money from Manitobans and Manitoban pockets that they're gonna fill. And you know what, the Premier is gonna try to paddle that canoe and sink it along with all of that's Manitobans' right. money along the way. The should be paddled. Paddling in the wrong direction. They are going to spend, they're gonna borrow, and then they're going to tax. This is the ways of this NDP government. As I mentioned, we have seen it before with the previous NDP government, Honourable Speaker, and we will see it again. Thank you. Are there any other speakers wishing to participate in the debate? Seeing none, is the House ready for the question? The question before the House is, shall the second reading of Bill 24, Bill 25, pass? The Interim Appropriation Bill 2024, shall it pass? Agreed and so ordered. The House will now resolve into a Committee of the Whole. Oh, the Honourable Official Opposition House Leader. On division. The motion is accordingly passed on division. The House will now resolve into Committee of the Whole to consider a report on Bill Number 25, the Interim Appropriation Act 2024, for concurrence and third reading. Would the Deputy Speaker please take the chair? Will the Committee of the Whole please come to order? We will now consider Bill 25, the Interim Appropriation Act 2024. Does the Honourable Minister of Finance have an opening statement? 
No? Okay. Does the official opposition critic have an opening statement? Okay, the honorable member for Fort Garrett, or Fort White. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair, and uh, everyone knows I like to speak, but uh, for this moment here, I, I have no opening statement. We shall now proceed to consider the bill clause by clause. The title and enacting clause are postponed until all the other clauses have been considered. Shall clause, shall clause one pass? Clause one is accordingly passed. Shall clause two pass? Clause two is accordingly passed. Shall clause three pass? Clause three is accordingly passed. Shall clause four pass? Clause four is accordingly passed. Shall clause five pass? Clause five is accordingly passed. Shall clause six pass? I hear a no. Uh, honorable member for Fort White. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and uh, it gives me honor uh, to ask some questions on the Internal Appropriation Act here, brought forward by the Minister of Finance. I appreciate the conversation the Minister of Finance and I had, I had earlier. Um, I believe this one is in regards to um, clause. Uh, Five or six. Well, the uh, in section uh, the bill talks about a two hundred fifty million nine million dollars to eliminate a long term liability. Uh, can the minister just tell us uh, what that long term liability is, and uh, if you can tell us if this will help reduce our debt as a province? The honourable minister of finance. Yeah, the authority here is used to make payments related to previously accrued liabilities, such as environmental liabilities and legal claims against the government. The amounts are reported in public accounts each year. Any other questions? The Honourable Member for Fort White. Uh, thanks, and I want to thank the uh, Minister for that uh, answer on that one. And uh, there's a, a $25 million uh, uh, up to $25 million may be paid out of the consolidated funds in 24-25 fiscal year for the purpose of developing or acquiring inventory uh, to be disposed of uh, in a subsequent year. Can the minister just maybe elaborate that on a little bit more? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Yeah, so the um, I think this is under Section 4, not Section 5, but I am happy to speak to it. Um, COVID-19 required the government to acquire supplies of PPE, of course, the previous government, PPE, vaccines, and other inventories. Those amounts have been normalizing in the last couple of years. So in this year, the amount has decreased from 50 million to 25 million. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair, and thank you, the Minister, for that. I appreciate going back uh, to that one. I, I missed the Section 4 uh, part there. Uh, are there any other uh, long-term liabilities um, that uh, or inventory expenditures that will be reduced, or was it mainly just the COVID uh, uh, expenditures for that? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, the long-term liabilities relate to, as I said, legal claims and environmental liabilities. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Apologize, I read the wrong header uh, for inventory expenditures. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, sorry, and I will ask for clarity. What was the question pertaining to inventory expenditures? The Honourable Member for Fort White. Uh, we can move on uh, to the next question, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, when I look at all the sections that we've gone through and passed, uh, I'm just curious as if the Minister uh, can't uh, just mention the uh, or speak a little bit about the uh, large increase in percentages of appropriations that are being asked for 75% um, to 90% uh, and onwards um, for the appropriation in uh, section A, section B, 75% to 90, 75% to 90, and section C. Um, so maybe the minister can just talk a little bit about why um, there's a large increase uh, being asked for in this interim appropriation. Uh, just before I pass it to the minister, I'll just remind folks that we are uh, to speak to the clause uh, that, that we're speaking to, which in this case is clause six. But if the minister would like to respond, Minister of Finance. Uh, we've got important work to do. 
fixing health care, improving affordability. The Honorable Member for Fort White. Uh, thank you, and uh, I appreciate that uh, question there. Without the budget being tabled here, um, on April 2nd, I understand it's coming forward for the 24-25 uh, year. Uh, and again, I understand that 90% of the appropriations being asked for 23-24. Uh, does the minister foresee, uh, with the budget being tabled, that they're going to uh, max out that 10% that's left in that appropriation, go above and beyond uh, to cover the 24-25 budget? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, what we're asking for in Part A is for 75%, so it's not 90% as has been suggested. Also, I would say that it doesn't seem that we're asking questions as it relates to the specific sections at this point. But. The Honourable Member for Fort White. So in, in, uh, in regards to um, the increase in appropriation, um, for the ask in this one here, then the minister wants to simply state that it's for um, the amount of work you have to do is for the increase in percentage ask right now. Just a clarification. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, what I can share is that the, uh, the amount is not dissimilar from what we saw in 2019, 2020, 2021. Of course, we know in some of those years there were elevated costs associated with COVID, but this also reflects what happened in 2018-19. It's very similar to numbers that have been put forward by the previous government. Are there any other questions? Uh, then, I'll, then I'll ask the committee, shall Clause 6 pass? Shall Clause 7 pass? Clause 7 is accordingly passed, and Clause 6 is accordingly passed. Uh, shall the enacting clause pass? The enacting clause is accordingly passed. Shall the title pass? I hear a no. The uh, Honourable Member for Fort White. Uh, so thank you, uh, Honourable Deputy Speaker, and uh, this allows me to an opportunity now to uh, go back and talk about the uh, the, the appropriation bill that we're seeing in front of us here. So uh, this will go back to the question um, that I asked the minister previously um, about the increase in appropriations. So I, I believe there is a right to, to have that conversation here uh, with this money being asked, um, uh, the amount of money also being asked uh, to $12.6 billion uh, or 75% of the total appropriations. When we look back to 2023, uh, only 35% uh, or $6 billion was asked from the total appropriations. So the question to the minister, uh, I, I asked this earlier, he had alluded to the answer, and then the second time around, uh, just a little more clarity on the uh, amount of money being asked in this appropriation versus historical, and he wants to reference historical um, debt asks uh, prior to, well, you know, 2020 were a worldwide pandemic and 21 pandemic. Uh, I, I don't believe there's a pandemic right now. So I believe Manitoba is just so curious. I'm just curious as to, as to why that increase in money. The Honourable Minister of Finance. I would suggest the reason for the much smaller number in 23-24 was that it was an election year. The Honourable Member for Fort White. So just, just to be clear, the Minister is saying that because there was an election in 23, that less money was asked for from the total appropriation. That's what the Minister's answer is as to why they're asking for 12.6 million, a billion, sorry, uh, and 75% of the total appropriation. Just curious if that's an answer. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, I don't know what decisions were made by the last government. I propose a possible answer for 23-24. What I can say is that the appropriation being asked for reflects the important work that we have to do. Uh, we were left a huge mess by the previous government. Uh, they absolutely did a massive uh, amount of damage to our health care system. 
they underfunded education, they underfunded municipalities, they failed to take care of affordability challenges that Manitobans were facing. We've got a lot of important work to do. We're going to do that in a, in a good way that ensures we balance our fiscal priorities and our, uh, our need to be fiscally responsible with delivering on the priorities of Manitobans. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and uh, I appreciate the Minister's answer on that, and, and I hadn't asked the Minister as to why he thinks the uh, 2023 um, interim appropriation was only $6 billion or 35%. I, he had said that this is why he assumed, so I said I was reiterating what he said, and he said it was because of an election, and that's why. And second answer, he said, well, they have work to do. He can't guess. I, I wouldn't ask him to guess why or what his answer was for the 2023. The question was for 2024. It's a $6.6 .6 billion increase in the appropriation that this government is asking for. The minister wants to mention, you know, affordability and crisis. Well, the previous government had left this government with a $250 million surplus. It's well documented that there was a surplus uh, when that happened. He wants to talk about affordability. Previous government had mailed out affordability checks, uh, historic support for Man Manitobans, uh, the largest tax cut savings in the history of this province, $5,500 or $4,500 uh, for a family, uh, given all of the other uh, affordability. $4,500, uh, I think uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker and the Minister will agree, $4,500 is a lot of money. Uh, it's a lot more than, on average, the $26 uh, the gas tax is saving that this government has put forward. Albeit, the question is specific to the $6.6 .6 billion increase over the ask. It's 75% of the total appropriation. The minister says uh, it's because of the amount of work they have to do. Okay, if that's the minister's prerogative. The follow-up question then would be, um, does the minister have a percentage or a budget of how much more this 24-25 budget is going to be um, when the uh, full amount of the appropriate amount from the 23-24 estimates has been used. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Yeah, I, I know the, the member opposite is, is just as excited as we are about the release of our budget on April 2nd, where he'll get clarity on these questions. Um, today isn't about that. Today is about ensuring that government has the ability to pay civil servants, keep programs running, keep delivering important services. I hope that they'll support that so we can continue to do that important work. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I, I agree with the Minister. See, we, we do agree in this House at times. Uh, I, I, we do want to see the budget So, uh, on April 2nd, so is there any chance the uh, Minister uh, will let me see the budget ahead of April 2nd? The Honourable Minister of Finance? No. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Fort White. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Deputy Speaker. We have to have a little bit of fun in here, and uh, this appropriation is important. It's important that, as the Minister says, that the government doesn't come to a halt, that we can pay our, the, the bills that are needed and the debts and the capital projects and the workers. So I, I, I agree with him. We're having a little bit of fun with that. Um, on, on a back to a serious question now, 75% of the total uh, appropriations being asked for in this uh, bill. Um, can the minister say um, yes or no that he will go over what was appropriated uh, in the previous budget, 2023-24 budget? The Honourable Minister of Finance. What Manitobans can expect from us is a much higher degree of fiscal responsibility than what we saw from the previous government. We know over this past fiscal year, and again, we. Uh, brought forward a report that was done by an independent accounting firm, which I know the, uh, the critic yesterday identified that he has a high degree of respect for. I'm sure he understands that they don't just write things willy-nilly without them being uh, based in fact. Uh, and what they wrote was that the previous government made a series of irresponsible budgetary decisions. That's the record that uh, the previous government has. That's not the way we're going to approach things. We're going to budget in a good way. We're going to plan and we're going to make sure that we deliver fiscal responsibility and accountability because we understand how important that is to allowing us to delivering on the important things that Manitobans sent us here to do, like fixing health care and making life more affordable. The Honourable Member for Fort White. 
Deputy Speaker, and uh, I agree. Uh, MNP uh, is a very reputable company um, in the province and, and throughout the world uh, on the work they do. The a concern with uh, uh, companies, the, the way MNP operates is they're only as good as the data they get. They can only operate on the information that they receive. Uh, and it clearly was written in the report that MNP did not audit or independently verify the accuracy or completeness of the supporting information. I mean, I don't know how much clearer we can make that. MNP did not audit or independently verify the accuracy or completeness of the supporting information. That's an important clause that the minister chooses to leave out. That as government chooses to leave out in their press releases and when there's an opportunity for them to speak, that they do not uh, mention that this was not independently verified. So with all due respect, we can move on from that point. Um, the minister will say, this government will say, well, the, these are the numbers, and we'll say with a clause like that in there, no, they're not. Uh, they're not real numbers. We need to see what the actual numbers are. Uh, albeit, though, when it comes to this appropriation, uh, does the minister, uh, when he looks at historically, as he wants to bring up, uh, see that the uh, historically, when it comes to interim appropriations, um, it has been 35, 35, 35, and now it's 75. Can the minister talk about the 40% increase that the government is now asking for in this, uh, uh, in this interim appropriation bill? The Honourable Minister of Finance. I'm not sure where the critic is getting his information from. Um, 2019, they asked for 75%. 2020, they asked for 75%. 2021, they asked for 75%. 2022, they asked for 75%. We're asking for 75 percent. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Uh, I, be I believe, uh, Deputy Speaker, the Minister will be, lo we might be looking at different data here points. Um, it was 35 uh, percent was the total appropriation, so it was from 2023, 6 billion or 35 percent um, in, in Part A. Yeah, you are asking for 75 percent in Part A. That, that's a 40 percent increase. Uh, 2023 was six billion dollars or 35 percent of total appropriation as set out in the 2022 estimates um, 12.6 billion or 75 percent of total appropriation so the, the question is, is simple uh, and again we're not we're not arguing here I want to be very clear we're not arguing about you know the the importance of this bill and going forward with this bill and that this bill is needed to cover the finances and, and the costs in the province we're good with that but the simple question is that this is a large increase from previous years so uh, for clarity on that, the minister has said that they have a lot of work to do, and that's okay, you have a lot of work to do. Uh, so that, that the 40% increase. The question then is, when you use up the remaining 25% uh, that is within this appropriation, um, or above this appropriation, does the minister have a percentage or number on what that's going to look like so Manitobans can be uh, prepared for that? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, well, again, I'll just clarify for the critic uh, the number that his government requested in, we'll start again here, in 2019 was 75%, 75% in 2020, 75% in 21, 75% in 22. The number that they uh, brought forward as an interim appropriation in 23-24 was for 35%. It was for $6 billion. So if we simply do the math and round that 35% up to around what it would be if they had used 75%, it would be roughly the exact equivalent of what we're bringing forward here in terms of an ask for appropriation. So um, again, uh, I, don't, I don't know where the confusion is coming here for the member, but the numbers are quite clear. If he wants me to show him historic data, I'm happy to do so. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and, and okay, we agree now. So we're heading in the right direction. So the question, percentage-wise, uh, is what I've been saying, is the minister's correct. So percentage-wise, the overall numbers will roughly equal 16.8, 17 billion, or we're in the billions dollar range. The question is, the appropriation previously was only for 35%. This act is asking for 75%. I'm asking why is there such a large increase in this act of 40% when the previous government to the own minister is saying proportionally was the same overall, but releasing 35 and releasing 75% is quite a big difference. It's actually a difference of $6.6 .6 billion. 
So that's what I'm asking the minister for, not based on percentages, just clarity on that increase of 40% in this ask. The Honourable Minister of Finance. I, I don't know why the previous government only asked for 35% in 23 24, but again, I, I hope the critic is listening here. The question you're asking me is a question you could pose your own, got your own previous government when you asked for 75% the four previous fiscal years prior to last year. So it's, I guess the answer is a common pattern. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. So um, the Minister is basing his ask just on historical patterns then, or needs? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm simply responding to the, the fact that the member seems to be indicating that this is unusual in some regard when his party did that four fiscal years in a row. I'll repeat the same answer I've offered already, uh, which is just broadly, we are uh, in need of doing a lot of important work in this province. I think the member opposite knows that and every member opposite knows that. We were left in a really tough spot here uh, with huge needs across the entire province. Um, again, the way that our government will work will be to ensure we balance uh, meeting those needs, those very important needs that Manitobans have. We're a listening government. We've heard them. We have a lot of work to do, and we're going to balance delivering on those needs with fiscal responsibility. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Deputy Speaker. Um, in, in Part B of the interim appropriation, uh, again, the same thing happens here. Um, this government is asking for a, a 15 percent, and this interim appropriation act, again, percentages, numbers, overall, um, works out to be the same once the, the whole budget is looked at. But up front, in the act, this government is asking for 90 percent of the total appropriation set out. So. 90% is a large percentage of anything. Uh, that only leaves you 10% left over until you have now uh, theoretically exhausted the budget of 23. I think everyone can see that. It, it, same thing in the last part A, there's only 25% available. So where the previous government had done 35, you're doing 75, gives you 25% room. Part B now gives you a 10% room. So can the minister maybe talk about why they are going 90% of the total appropriation set out uh, in uh, Part B? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Yeah, again, uh, just to enlighten the member about the historic record, his government asked for 90% in 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. This is not uncommon. Uh, again, he can uh, inquire with previous leadership within his own party as to why they did that. Uh, there's a lot of important work to do. Part B encompasses capital investments for government. Um, we know that uh, it's important that those dollars are there to continue uh, that important capital investment work that's already in process, not new, net new items, which of course can only be funded once a budget is passed. Uh, nothing uncommon here. This is exactly the same. Uh, that we saw from the previous PC government over the four years that I listed. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Thank you, Honourable Deputy Speaker. And in the interest of saving time and moving on to uh, the lovely 30-minute uh, speeches that uh, everyone has ready to go, uh, myself included, um, we look at the Part A, uh, previous government 35 percent, this government 75 percent. Part B, previous government, 75 percent, this one, 90 percent. Part C, um, again, same thing, previous government had uh, 75 percent, 90 percent. Um, it goes on and on, Part D, same thing, uh, and onward. So the, the question of concern for Manitobans should be that this government, this NDP government, is asking for the mass lion's share of the total appropriation up front, which signifies that they are going to burn through the, the total appropriated amount for the previous budget that was allotted in the budget, the 23-24 budget. Manitobans should be concerned, and everyone in this room is concerned now, that once that runs out, that appropriate amount, and then this government tables their budget on April 2nd, they are then going to essentially double this amount, or maybe even triple this amount. If the minister is only leaving 10% of wiggle room, uh, and the appropriation for a B, C, and D, 
and 25% in A, which is the $16.8 billion versus the previous governments of $6 billion, there is massive concern that this appropriate amount is going to, uh, the budget is then going to dwarf whatever this appropriate amount is. Um, there's not much uh, comment, I guess, to be on that, other than, you know, I'll ask the minister, and I'll be shocked if he's going to share that with me. Uh, but does the minister want to uh, tell everyone in the House here today how much more is a budget 24-25 that is going to be tabled on April 2nd going to be more than these appropriated amounts? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Well, again, uh, Honourable Chair, we're, we're not here to release the budget. We're here to uh, hopefully, with the support of the opposition, uh, be able to gain access to the funding we need to continue the operations of government. Um, you know, I do want to just again raise uh, w for the critic um, it, this business of dishonesty and, and not being clear and transparent about the data you're sharing. You continue to cherry pick the 23 24 fiscal year, which was an election year. I don't know what decisions led to the percentage differences, but again, the four previous years all have the same percentages in A, B, C, and D as those we're bringing forward here. So, you know, this, uh, I understand uh, the, you know, the desire to make a point uh, at some level, but there's really too much glossing over the, the truth here uh, to a really egregious extent. Four years in a row, the percentages requested from their government were the same as what we're bringing forward. So the argument that he's trying to build here, that this reflects something different or some fiscal risk that we're creating, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, but we can say that, uh, again, I'm happy to repeat it, the, the notion that we are somehow uh, presenting some kind of uh, fiscal irresponsibility in doing this is obviously patently false, but more importantly, uh, we have the reality of the previous government's record to contend with that was independently verified by a respected accounting firm. Uh, that's not politics. That's just the reality of the situation. We had MNPs, a respected uh, group of uh, accountants that did an independent verification of what we brought forward and verified that to be true. If, if Manitobans uh, have anything to be concerned about, it's about the pattern of fiscal irresponsibility from the previous government. They can be confident, Manitobans can feel very confident that we are bringing forward a strong plan that will ensure we invest in those areas that Manitobans want to see us invest in while we balance the, the books. That is exactly what Manitobans can expect from us. So, you know, again, uh, these questions, while I appreciate them, uh, I would ask the member to look at his own party's record and he'll see. Uh, there's nothing diverging here from what has been the norm historically. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate the Minister's comments. And, you know, I apologize if I was misleading or, or glossing over some facts. I was just going back to last year's. I didn't want to go back two, three, four, five years. Uh, it was just the, the last year's numbers I thought would be most relevant in discussing the appropriation of this. I, I think it is important. I think it is important that uh, we, we identify that it was 35% and now 75, 75 now 90 for this government. Uh, and I, and I, I can appreciate that historically it was 75%, uh, as, the, as the Minister says. Um, and if we want to go back to 2019, I, I think it's very important that Manitobans know that uh, after years of steady improvement under this PC government, that led to two surpluses in this province, 2019 and 2022-23. So uh, the minister can reference that the appropriations were high um, and that there was fiscal mismanagement. Um, the numbers don't lie. I mean, the minister wants to reference MNP numbers that are unaudited, uh, not, indep uh, not independently verified. Uh, these are verified audited numbers. That 2019, surplus. 2022, 23, surplus. Last time that was done, Honorable uh, Deputy Chair, was 2008. 2008, 2008, 2009, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 17, maybe half of 17. Um, nine years under NDP, uh, and they didn't have a surplus in, in their operations. Um, so I, I believe that is something uh, 
that you know the minister wants to talk about appropriation and fiscal management. I think those are important facts. The facts matter. Um, this minister is asking for a blank check for 90 percent, 75 percent, for Part A, and 75 percent or 90 percent for the remaining, uh, and hasn't even tabled the budget yet. The concern is that the appropriation ask is very high compared to historical uh, last year or previous years where there was a surplus run by the PC government, that it's going to run this province into fiscal mismanagement and over borrowing. Um, that is the concern. That's why we're here today. Um, in regards to that, I will pass the uh, questions over uh, to uh, Honourable Deputy, uh, Honourable Leader, Honourable Le Leader, Leader. To, am I to ask a question? Apologize, I have to ask a question, right? Right? Apologies. Preferably, yes, a question. Apologies. Um, the <laughs> Honorable Member for Fort White. I uh, pass the uh, questions now to the leader uh, of our intern leader of our party. The Honorable Minister of Finance. Uh, I didn't get a question there. I believe the member was looking to pass it to one of his colleagues. Uh, to pass the floor to one of his colleagues, if that's their decision, then I look forward to further questions. The leader of the official opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and and it's uh, interesting to sit here and listen to the question and answer time between finance critic and the finance minister. So I appreciate both of. Uh, both of your times here this afternoon. So uh, a couple of just quick questions in regards to uh, the interim supply here that we're, that we're debating this afternoon and, and getting forward to keep the, to keep the wonderful province uh, rolling along. Uh, Mr. Finance Minister, just uh, asking a question in regards to the prior to, since, since we're talking about that 23-24 fiscal year and since we were talking about carrying on and, and moving forward with capital plans and, and that's basically just taking uh, words from, from the minister's mouth from a couple minutes ago. Uh, during previous, uh, prior to the 2023 election, um, the former progressive conservative government made a promise to the uh, community of Lactabani and surrounding areas for a personal care home. And um, and the money was in place and it passed through Treasury Board and passed through Cabinet. And I know that his leader, uh, the now Premier, um, also promised uh, that if the NDP had formed government in the 2023 election, that they would be moving forward with the Lactabani Personal Care Home. So I'm just wondering, since we have the Finance Minister here, um, does he see the pause lifting off of the Lactavani personal care home and the other five personal care homes promised pre, uh, prior to them getting elected, being lifted and proceeding on, um, on those personal care homes? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to see that the uh, interim leader of the opposition is just as excited as others to uh, see our budget on April 2nd. Um, we know that uh, there's a huge need uh, to improve access to personal care homes in Manitoba. Uh, of course, uh, the member opposite and the interim leader was, uh, as the representative for Lactabani, uh, in government for seven years and spent many of those years in cabinet and yet uh, was not able to deliver on that project for his community. Uh, I'm sure it's something that uh, members of, the, of his constituency are, um, pushed him uh, to deliver on, and fortunately he was not able uh, in seven years to, to deliver on that for residents of, of that constituency. Um, we're excited about our budget on April 2nd. Uh, we know um, there's a ton of good news in there for Manitobans. We're excited to bring it to the House and uh, looking forward to uh, revealing that soon. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and just to correct the record, uh, it's unfortunate that the Finance Minister puts a couple of those uh, 
a little bit of misinformation on the record, but uh, technically the the personal care home was was not only promised, it uh, was uh, delivered. And the problem is, is that when the NDP, and, and again, um, if the minister is saying that I have to uh, wait till the budget, which is good. I, I, I appreciate that he puts that on the record because I'll be making sure that I'll be letting my constituents know that um, April 2nd, we should be looking at the pause being lifted on the personal care home. We know that the amount of money um, that was dedicated uh, to the Lactimony personal care home and the other personal care homes that were, um, that were announced we know that because of the pause and because of the pause had carried over into the year of 2024 and with new building codes and those things, I'm also hoping that the upcoming budget that we're talking about the interim supply right now, that the upcoming budget, April 2nd, that he is aware as finance minister. And I know that, you know, he, he has uh, some background in, in some, uh, in some of the various different trades around the province and that. So he would would know that the increase in prices will, will go up eight to $10 million just on that one project alone. So hopefully, um, you know, in the in the upcoming budget, uh, they're, they're accounting for that. So when they lift the pause, because again, um, his leader, the now premier had stated it in written articles that he would deliver uh, or continue on with the elective only personal care home. So uh, it's good to hear today that I'll be able to share um, with my constituents in the Lactabani constituency that uh, we're waiting for the budget. And, and it looks like um, and I think, uh, you know, possibly he's hinting at the pause being lifted on the on April 2nd. Uh, I'm also interested uh, since I have some time left on the clock to hear his opinion on the fact that uh, that his government, and because he's finance minister, had uh, written uh, orders in council, I know he received uh, copies of them yesterday when I tabled them, to the fact that the NDP are borrowing almost $10 billion. And so I'm assuming because they're borrowing almost $10 billion, half a billion dollars of that each and every year moving forward is going to be on top of the debt servicing costs to Manitobans. So I just would like to know why in a year, unless he's got some form of crystal ball that I don't know what's going to happen this coming spring and summer, but in a year when we have had no flooding, like the previous Selinger government had to tackle and, and uh, of course, a worldwide pandemic, which the progressive conservative government had to tackle. Why in the world is he borrowing and signed orders in council for uh, almost $10 billion? Or is it maybe setting Manitobans up for, uh, for the floodgates of, of some uh, incredible spending here that the NDP government are going to be doing in the upcoming fiscal uh, fiscal year. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you. Uh, the irony of these questions, of course, is that this debt is refinancing debt that was issued under the previous government. And I'll help the interim leader understand it so he can hopefully put this question to rest. During the pandemic, you had significant cash needs as a government to help manage the various cost increases that their government was dealing with. In order to meet those needs, they needed to have money be borrowed and they needed to issue debt. Because it was the pandemic, buyers of debt only wanted to buy debt for shorter periods. So there was a significant amount of debt issued by that government for two year periods, which is unusually short. The reason was because it was a pandemic. Buyers were uncertain. They ended up uh, issuing a significant amount of debt to meet their elevated cash needs during COVID for two year periods. That two year period has now, uh, much of the, that financing is elapsing and needs to be refinanced. There's nothing to see here. It has to do with refinancing debt issued under the interim leader's previous government in a pandemic when they had elevated cash needs 
and issued a lot of debt on two-year periods. It's debt that they issued. I don't know how much more clearly I can say that. Any more? Oh. The uh, leader of the official opposition. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for that. And and uh, it is interesting when the when the finance minister starts to starts to get up on the on the on his podium and and start to uh, educate others, especially when it comes time for any type of conversation on debt and driving the province further into debt like the previous NDP government did. Uh, they more than the previous NDP government under uh, one of their uh, advisors, um, Premier Dewar and then uh, Premier Selinger, which um, ended up raising and tripling the debt of the province to the tune of $25 billion. And then with their mishandling, and since this minister is in charge of Manitoba Hydro as well, the mishandling of Manitoba Hydro uh, raised the Manitoba Hydro's debt to $25 billion. So now the $10 billion that the minister is, is uh, educating, obviously not only myself, but everyone else in the house, because I know that his caucus colleagues are sitting there listening attentively to him and, and learning, uh, because I know that many of them on that side of the house, um, not all of them, some of them, uh, don't do their homework regularly, but uh, the finance minister is, is taking this time to, to try to uh, turn the page, distract and deflect on, um, on, the, on his record and on his premier's record on some of his other ministerial records. So it is gonna be interesting when the budget gets uh, announced on April 2nd. We do look forward to seeing what there is in there. And, and I guess it's a bit of a, a carryover on uh, you know, some of the money that was allocated to the personal care homes. And I guess he's going to, uh, he's gonna basically try to take some credit, much like what his premier's been doing for the last, uh, the last few weeks or since, uh, since the beginning of January. So I guess uh, this reckless spending that we are going to be seeing eventually from the NDP is going to is going to increase those inflation rates, and I know that he will crow that inflation is low, and and most of that has to do now? with uh, the lack the of their almost. ability to uh, bring in and increase the economy here in in Manitoba. So it will be interesting and it'll also, and part of my reasoning for coming on and asking some questions is to also put on the record some facts that they have, the NDP since forming government, they've cut many uh, things which, which would have either made life more affordable to Manitobans or at least make their life easier. And so I look forward to their new plan, and I say new with quotations, because they had cut nine new schools and almost 660 daycare spaces, which some of those schools are actually in NDP-held constituencies. So I don't quite understand why the NDP caucus members, MLAs, are not questioning a little bit more of their caucus colleagues. Especially I think probably chair. due to the culture within their caucus uh, probably is a little toxic and I think they're a little worried of the ramification that they'd be getting from the Premier. So I'd like to ask uh, the Minister of Finance, is there, uh, is, is he going to raise the, the pause on the uh, nine new schools? and the six personal care homes. And why are they continuing to delay surgeries and uh, cut those programs if he's, if he's saying that, that they are uh, you know, gonna be moving forward and, and making better changes for Manitobans? We're not seeing any plans. So I'm hoping come budget time, 
there will be the odd plan uh, unveiled because so far I don't think Manitobans are seeing much. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know what uh, that five minutes was meant to accomplish. Um, but I can say again, I've answered it already, we're not here to announce our budget, uh, no matter how many ways they want to try to ask. We're here to ensure that government has the funds it needs to operate to continue delivering on ongoing services programs uh, for Manitobans, to keep the lights on. We're not here to make announcements uh, to the opposition. Uh, in terms of this question about uh, a plan, uh, we're excited about the work we're doing and we do have a plan and we are going to deliver again that important balance that we know Manitobans are waiting for because they haven't seen it in some time in terms of balancing our fiscal responsibilities with the priorities of Manitobans. I can say uh, clearly, again, the members opposite like to continue to pat themselves on the back about fictional information about having left Manitobans with a surplus. They left Manitobans with a $1.6 billion deficit. They don't, they don't seem to believe what every other Manitoban knows, which is that that is accurate. That's a statement of fact. And again, uh, their, own, their own critic for finance has said himself, he believes in MNP. He knows they're, this isn't a, a side wing of the NDP in Manitoba. This is a respected accounting firm. These folks don't just write uh, whatever you want them to write, they're professionals. And so, you know, again, if the interim leader is questioning a professional accounting firm and wants Manitobans to believe his version of the facts, I got news for him, I don't think it's going to go over very well. Manitobans know that the reality is they left us a mess. We can see it really clearly. We provided independent evidence of that. I also can just take a, another minute just to, uh, and I know the, the interim leader probably is really not wanting to hear this information I'm about to share, which is why he's splitting out the door, that they made a number of very irresponsible budgetary decisions. Sorry. Oh, that kept him here. Comment on the absence of, of more presence of members in the chamber. The, the Honourable Minister of Finance. I apologize for referencing uh, the absence of a member uh, from the House at a key time during debate. Look. He's, he can't seem to find the door. Uh, I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to give the minister one more chance at, at an apology. Just in your in your apology. Sorry. In your apology, you were again referencing the absence or presence of a member. So I would. So I. Sorry, the honourable minister of finance. I apologize for referencing his potential absence. He's still here. The leader of the official opposition on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the point of order, um, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that the member who has been given the, the privilege and the honour appointed to be the finance minister of the province of Manitoba is making such rude comments from his chair. It is, it is unbelievable, Mr. Chair, um, that he would sit in his chair. I strongly recommend to the minister of finance and to his colleagues on that side of the house to do some homework. There's a rule book. There is a process book for our chamber. I understand that the MLA for Concordia is upset. I know that the MLA for Concordia doesn't do his homework on a regular basis. We see that the Premier stands up on a day-to-day -day basis. 
reprimanding the justice minister for not doing his homework. So I appreciate the co sorry. point of order. Um, I will accept order. I will. Oh, order. sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, <laughs> point of order is a serious matter, and I'd ask that you speak directly to what your point of order concern is, the or what the breach of the debate. rules is, and it shouldn't be used for debate. So the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for your, for your sage advice. So the point of order is the fact that the Finance Minister doesn't know the rules. He should do his homework, but I do accept his apology for fictitiously saying that I've left the Chamber. It is inappropriate, and especially the way he, that he did it. Thank you for giving me an opportunity on the point of order, uh, Mr. Chair. So I recognize the member for Kirkfield, Kildoning River East, uh, speaking to the point of order. It's a, a new point of order that res, uh, okay, arose I, I to, during that I one. To, sure, no problem. Yeah, we'll get there. Uh, so there was no point of order in that uh, there was no specific rule that was outlined to have been breached. And uh, I would point out that the word fictitious walks a line and is slightly inflammatory. So we would like to avoid uh, using that language moving forward. And now I will move on to the honorable member for Kildonan River East. Um, I don't know if it's a point of order. I don't know of all the fancy lingo here, but I would just like us to all respect the speakers uh, comments earlier to remind everyone in the House to be respectful of the language that uh, the Speaker has asked us to use, to refrain from using Mr. or Mrs. and to, refrain, or to refer to the Chair as Honourable Chair and uh, to refrain from using pronouns. And it was uh, referred by the uh, previous Speaker, the uh, uh, Leader of the Official Opposition, multiple times when they are referring to, uh, to you, Deputy Speaker. Mm -hmm. Give me the same point. Okay. The member for Interlake Gimli on the same point of order. Yeah, thank you, uh, Honourable Chair. Uh, we all strive. I, I want to apologize to start off with, uh, and uh, the member is right, although it is not a point of order, but I do want to apologize on uh, behalf of everybody in this uh, chamber that uh, uh, unintentionally uh, uses a pronoun when it shouldn't be used. And, um, Honourable Chair, uh, please accept apology from uh, this side of the chamber.
so there was no point of order because no rule was uh, breached, and I appreciate the reminder uh, to honor folks' um, pronouns and honorifics that everyone has chosen. Uh, just a reminder that both me and the speaker uh, would appreciate uh, the term honorable speaker and honorable deputy speaker. Yeah. Okay, uh, the honorable member for Fort White. Uh, thank you, um, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the member for Kelowna River East, and it is important. It's very important to bring it up. You're right, the Speaker had mentioned that. Um, at times, people will say things by accident. They'll, they'll. It, it's a different day and age we live in. People are, are, I believe, trying. I think there's a little bit of compassion needed, as we saw the other day when I was speaking, and a member on the opposite side had made an accidental comment on on fasting. We let it slide. You, you move on. You apologize sincerely. I believe our house leader has apologized sincerely, but it's something to learn from, and these mistakes will happen again. Uh, so it's mindful to be aware of that and just generously move forward. Um, honorable Deputy Chair. Uh, getting back to the Minister uh, of Finance here, so we can circle back, and there won't be any five-minute questions here, so don't worry. Just that I want to ask the, I, I believe the Minister did comment in question period earlier that uh, this budget of 24-25 will be a balanced budget. Can the Minister confirm that? It the Honourable Minister of Finance. Now, we committed to delivering a balanced budget at the end of our first term. Uh, if I use that term, and it was like thought to be, to indicate that we were going to balance it in 24-25, uh, that was uh, my fault to use language that indicated that we're committed to a balanced budget at the end of our first term. And that's what our premier and our party has said throughout the election. The honorable member for Fort White. Thank you, honorable deputy chair. And, and I may be mistaken, so we'll, we'll, we'll look back into it. But on the record, uh, end of the first term is what the minister is saying. So we'll go with that. Um, the. Equalization payment um, that this government is receiving from the federal government, a 24% increase of uh, $843 million. Um, has that uh, equalization payment come into the uh, uh, hands of the government now, and will that be uh, uh, booked to the uh, 24, starting in 24, 25 uh, fiscal year uh, for this government? The Honorable Minister of Finance. Uh, those equalization payments are relative to the 24-25 fiscal year. The Honourable Member for Fort White. And uh, will that uh, equalization payment be uh, coming in every year, uh, X amount every year, or will all be uh, uh, accounted for in 24-25, or is there a, uh, uh, I guess, a Cruel of that over time, if the minister can maybe clarify that for Manitobans. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Those dollars will be applied against the 24-25 fiscal year. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Thank you, Honourable Deputy Chair. Um, the member had referenced uh, the $10 billion for refinancing charges, and I, and I appreciate the Minister's time uh, to have a conversation about that off, uh, off channel about that. And, and that was to refinance um, uh, maturing debt that was taken out during the COVID crisis, I believe, and the, that two year term uh, was up. And so the, that borrowing money of $10 billion or 9.25, uh, what we have recorded was for that payment of maturing debt. Is that correct? The Honourable Minister of Finance. The number that I referenced was $7 billion. And again, uh, the majority of that was refinancing debt that was issued under the previous government. The Honourable Member for Fort White. So that uh, the majority of that debt, uh, if my memory serves me right, I believe that this government had taken out, previous government had taken out about $1.5 billion in, in COVID uh, expenses. Uh, this minister is saying it's closer to seven billion was the amount required for uh, refinancing of this. Um, can the minister provide us with a breakdown of what's included uh, within that maturing debt? Is it a consolidated debt? Is it simply just the COVID debt? Um, has that um, other debts been put into this uh, 9.25 or 7 billion, sorry, the minister says. Uh, what is within that maturing debt, uh, or is it a consolidated debt uh, with a, a bunch of other expenses within there, or debts within there? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Again, uh, the number 9 million or 9 billion continues to be raised. I, I'm, 
happy to get clarity on that. I don't know where the, uh, the critic is getting that number. Uh, there were seven billion of parameter borrowing authority that was issued. Again, uh, while it doesn't encompass the entire uh, seven billion, the vast majority pertains to uh, funding that the previous government had sought uh, during uh, COVID. Uh, that was for a short term period of two years, much of that debt that was issued as a result, that's coming due now for refinancing. That is why we have an unusually high uh, number here, and it's explained by the previous government's financing decisions. The Honourable Member for Fort White. So the, uh, thank you, Honourable Deputy Chair. The $9.25 billion is a number that was uh, obtained through orders in council that this NDP government had done uh, on January 17, 2024. Uh -huh. Um, I, I won't go through reading uh, the extent of it, but on, on January 17, 2024, uh, this government had taken a $9.25 billion uh, through orders in council of $7 billion, uh, of which go to what the minister was alluding to. So um, that within that, uh, in the uh, budget that's being tabled on April 2nd, will there be a breakdown of what's, what's contained within this uh, $7 billion uh, order in council for the uh, consolidated debt? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, the $7 billion, uh, as has been explained repeatedly, the vast majority of that pertains to debt that was issued by the previous government during COVID. It is an unusually high number to be refinancing because the previous government had financed an unusually high amount of borrowing during COVID. So we are uh, simply refinancing uh, those dollars. We, we have to refinance that. Those dollars don't just disappear. We continue to need uh, those dollars to be in place. So we're refinancing them. Again, the reason being there was elevated cash needs that the previous government had. During COVID, they issued a lot of debt to meet those needs. They issued a lot of two-year terms for that debt. And now we are in a position where we need to refinance that. Um, again, um, just the member continues to reference uh, $9 billion. Uh, I have uh, the order in council, which it sounds like he has as well. And it's very clear in that it says uh, $7 billion. So I don't know where this $9 billion figure continues to uh, come from, but the OIC that he's referencing clearly states a $7 billion figure. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Honourable Deputy Speaker. Uh, I mean, we'll, we can move on. For that. The Order of Council has a total borrow amount of $9.25 billion. I do see in the first one it's $7 billion, but there's a $1.5 billion, a $500 million, and a $250 million. But I, I digress and move on for that. I, I'm not, uh, the $7, seven billion, $9 billion isn't the question. The question was in reference to um, will there be a detailed breakdown of what is within this consolidated debt? in the budget in 24-25. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, I'll admit, uh, being new to this uh, role, I, I'm not exactly sure the level of detail that will be provided on that question in the upcoming budget. Any other? Oh, the Honourable Member for Fort White. Yeah, and I thank uh, the Minister for that uh, forward question. Uh, does the Minister know what the terms on this borrowing uh, was for this uh, uh, $7 billion order in council with the uh, borrowing terms on that work? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Um, there would have been a variety of terms as a result uh, of having to refinance uh, that debt. I can, uh, as the member would know, we're in, a, a, unfortunately, a much higher interest rate environment. So the two-year terms of maturity that were issued under his government are now coming due. Unfortunately, we're in a higher interest rate environment, and that debt needs to be refinanced under those higher interest rates. One thing I can say is that we have incredible folks working in the Department of Finance and the Treasury Division who do an incredible job, a really great job, of ensuring that we pay as little as possible for borrowing. Uh, just an amazing team. So I know that while we are in a higher interest rate environment, they're doing their, their very best to make sure that those dollars are accessed at the lowest cost possible. The Honourable Member for Fort White. 
Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker, and I, and I agree with the Minister. We have uh, There are amazing folks that work in this building who do an absolutely wonderful job, and uh, I'm sure in all the departments across the board, uh, they do a great job uh, here. Um, does the, does the, the terms the Minister might not know, but does the Minister know what the uh, costs are um, on servicing this debt on a monthly or annual basis? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, I don't have the specific figures for that $7 billion in debt that is being refinanced. Um, that's a number I, I think we could probably uh, seek to obtain, but I do not have that figure with me. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Thank you, Honourable Deputy Speaker. I only have about two more questions, so we'll keep it uh, two or three questions max, and then we'll, we'll move on uh, to our lovely 30-minute speeches by uh, about 10 of our members I know are really excited to speak, so <laughs> about five hours. Um, the equalization payment that the minister referenced to is going to be booked in 2024. Um, that was announced by the federal government um, in, in the fiscal year of 2023. So why wasn't that booked in the 2023 um, uh, budget or balance sheet? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, well, again, those... Uh, those equalization payments and that announcement pertain to funding that would be provided for the, the following fiscal year. Um, and so that would be why it would be uh, accrued in that year. Uh, I do want to say, though, the member is alluding to this, um, that they seem to be, at this point, playing games with this interim appropriation process that we're in. This is incredibly important, uh, Honourable Chair. Uh, we're here to make sure we have the funding we need and uh, this is about keeping the lights on. So I don't know why we're talking about five hours of speeches. There's not really a, a lot more here to discuss. We've been very clear in, about uh, what it is we're asking for. And I hope the members opposite will support getting this done for Manitobans. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Uh, thank you, Honourable Deputy Speaker. And, uh... I, I appreciate that, and uh, I guess I'll have to go back and look at that uh, an actual announcement for the equalization payment and, and when that should be accrued or accounted for. Uh, you know, we had, we had commented back and forth, and we've had some moments of levity in here, and that was uh, simply a moment of levity uh, with the minister. I guess I, I won't make any uh, more comments like that on the five hours. Um, this is very serious, and that's why we're spending a lot of time discussing this. Um, on a serious note, when we look at the act, uh, the total appropriation of this act, uh, in 2023, it was for $7.9 billion uh, by the previous government, and this one here is for $14.8 billion, double what the previous government had asked for. So again, I'll give the minister an opportunity to discuss on why is this appropriation act double what the previous government had asked for. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Well, again, uh, we've been through this multiple times. They only asked for 35% of the year to be funded. We're asking for 75%, which is what they did for the four years prior to last year. This is par for the course, nothing to see. Uh, we're doing the important work here of ensuring that we have the money necessary to keep the lights on, keep services and programs moving to serve Manitobans. Uh, we're looking to do that important work of fixing health care, making our province more affordable. Uh, and we're excited to bring our budget forward on April 2nd. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Deputy Speaker. and. Uh, on, on, uh, on a closing comment here, I will simply state that, uh, you know, the minister had, had mentioned that he doesn't know why we keep referencing, uh, or I had referenced MNP as a reputable firm, and MNP is a reputable firm. Everyone knows that. Uh, but they're, again, they're a firm that is reputable based on the data they get. When the data they get is one-sided from one input that's not audited, that's not verified, that's not independently verified, MNP will take the numbers and they'll, they'll pump out whatever you give them. That is what was clear was done in this report. I'm not questioning the credibility of MNP. The question was around the credibility of the information that was being given to MNP to create this poor report. On that, uh, I, I want to thank the minister uh, and all the colleagues for putting up with these uh, questions. I look forward to uh, continuing uh, the debate on this act. Would the minister like to comment? Seeing no further questions, shall the title pass?
The title is accordingly passed. Shall the bill be reported? Agreed, the bill shall be reported. That concludes the business before the committee. Committee rise and call in the speaker. The Honorable Member for Lodge Modi. Honorable Speaker, the Committee of the Whole has considered Bill 25, the Interim Appropriation Act 2024, and reports the same with, without amendment. I move, seconded by the Honorable Member for Fort Richmond, that the report of the Committee be received. It has been moved by the Honourable Member for Lajmodier, seconded by the Honourable Member for Fort Richmond, that the report of the committee be received. Is it the will of the House to uh, agreed? Agreed and so ordered. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed and so ordered. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I move, seconded by the Minister of Health, Seniors, Long-Term Care, that Bill Number 25, the Interim Appropriation Act 2024, Loi de 2024, portant affectation anticipée de crédit, reported from the Committee of the Whole, be concurred in and be now read for a third time and passed. It has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Finance, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care, that Bill No. 25, the Interim Appropriation Act 2024, reported from the Committee of the Whole, be concurred in and be now read a th for a third time and passed. The floor is open for debate. Honourable Member for Turtle Mountain. Well, thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I um, want, want to put a few words on the, the record for this bill, the appropriation bill, and I want to say, um, you know, I just listened to what was happening in the chamber between our critic of finance and the Minister of Finance, and it was quite interesting when the Minister of Finance had indicated that uh, their concern right now is fiscal responsibility, and, and I don't know if fiscal responsibility and the NDP actually go hand in hand here, because the fact is, I love history, and I know the history lesson that we can share here for a lot of the new members who've just been elected uh, to the NDP here, and um, I'm sure um, the, member, the Minister of Ag Agriculture and the Minister of Justice remembers the times of the days of the, the NDP, the spendy NDP that we used to nickname them, because they had a record of really uh, bad fiscal management. And I remember one time, actually, there was a person who was actually part of uh, film and government and line government. And what would happen was when, uh, when before we got elected, uh, the, film and Scott, um, the film and government got elected, um, there, there was a you know, crossover. I remember there was, uh, uh, you know, you know what, in 1988, there was an election and, um, and, the, and the, the film and government got in. And I remember one of the things that said, that the Pali government, you know, more than doubled the debt of the province. The, every indication that happened in the, during the Selinger Dewar days, it's the same thing happened back in the day. So there's a saying goes, history doesn't repeat itself. In the financial world, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So I'm thinking now that, you know, you know my mother-in-law used to always say that um, there, when there's a good expression, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. The NDP said that they're going to be actually balancing the budget at the, at the end of the term. And I would say, you know, with their records, I can't, none of us can believe that. 
uh, Honourable Speaker. And the thing is, right now, they, are, they actually have over $3 billion of promises that they did during the last election. And I know when the last time, the member from, Ju uh, the Minister of Justice can remember too, that I remember when we came into government, we inherited an $800 million deficit. And meanwhile, when, we, when, they, when they took over from us, we actually gave them a 275 surplus for the fiscal year um, of last year. And you know, they say about uh, balancing the budget. You know, during the whole time, Selinger's government, when the member for justice what first became an MLA, they didn't balance any budget. They didn't know what a budget was. They just kept on spending, spending, and spending, uh, Honorable Speaker. And you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, one thing I have to say, when it comes to uh, the BEP budget, I am so glad that when I was a transportation minister, that I put five-year budget into the program so that there is going to be, because back in the days of the Selinger government, the, the saying that we used to make for them was they, 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 they raid, 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 and then parade just before election. That was, the elect, that was what we used to do about transportation and infrastructure, which is probably the most important investment in this province right now. And right now I'm hearing from the construction industry right now that there is um, no tendering happening right now. Everything's being put on hold. And now the construction scene's coming and none of them are getting ready. They're actually now telling me that they're laying off employees. And so the thing is, this is a big concern, um, Honorable Speaker, when it comes to the budget. So the thing is, I know in the past, especially during the Selinger days, you know, they made sure that their friends were looked after, their union friends were looked after. We saw teachers making the highest income and giving the worst results and during, the, during the Selinger government, Honorable Speaker. We were number nine out of ten. Ten out of ten. It got to a point where we were going to get ten out of ten. The t we were bottom rank and we were spending the most money in education. And the thing is, when we took over government, Honorable Speaker, I remember there were so, de so many deferred maintenance issues that were happening with our schools, with our hospitals. We had to make sure that we had to reinvest money into those infrastructures of buildings because they never took care of them, Honorable Speaker. They made sure that their union friends were all taken care of, Honorable Speaker. And the thing is, all the promises that they're creating right now, that's $3 billion, Honorable Speaker. And I want to say that, um, you know, right now, we, when we looked at infrastructure, we invested, we made sure that, we, you know, Winnipeg is going to become a, mil a population of a million people. We wanted to make sure that we invested in infrastructure. Right now, I don't see any activity happening with McGilvery. You know, we were uh, doing St. Mary's. I'm going to feeling like, you know, the member for Concordia, he wanted to open more intersections, uh, Honorable Speaker. That was his thing. He wanted to have more intersections, put more lights on the perimeter highway. And that was unsafe for a lot of drivers who are on that perimeter highway. As our population okay, is going to go higher and more population going outside the city amongst the, uh, the perimeter highway, it's going to, he wants more Thank intersections you, put on there, more lights. And right now, they, that's what they did. They underspent in infrastructure, never in invested like we see with freeway systems that we see in Saskatchewan, Honourable Speaker. Regina has intersections. There, you don't stop when you go around the city of Win Regina. There's a new perimeter highway around the city of Regina, Honourable Speaker. And when it comes to uh, Saskatoon, these are, these are like American cities almost with the inter infrastructure that they invested. And this, this uh, government, um, NDP government, and, and again, the Minister of Justice remembers those days where not, like they just put more traffic lights along the perimeter highway. And then he, and when he's in opposition, he wants us to put more traffic lights on the perimeter highway so that people have able to come on and have, have um, accidents, Matt, Honourable Speaker. And so, you know what, um, I want to make sure that, you know, when we're in opposition here, that our highways, I know of the Minister of, of Agriculture, for instance, you know, he talks about infrastructure, and the fact is, you know, he made sure that his constituency of Swan River was looked after, but meanwhile, where the oil was coming from, when the oil was coming from uh, in the southwest corner, they didn't spend a dime for many, many years. When I came in as a, in a by-election, one of the biggest uh, uh, concerns that the, the media asked me about, what is the biggest concern in our neck of the woods? And I just said, you know what, it was infrastructure. 
The, the Selinger government, the Dury government, did not put any money into infrastructure. Not a penny. Not a penny. And I, like I said, you know, Highway 23, it was never done until, until we came into government. And then we're investing in Highway 75. You know, this thing, again, I just want to make sure that when we get back into government again, they don't leave us with a huge deficit and a financial mess. I remember when I first, um, um, when we was first assigned to a, a, a committee, it was the Fiscal Responsibility Committee. And I know um, when it came to um, my, the member from, from uh, Gimli, um, Gimli Interlake, he was also on that committee, uh, member for River Interlake. North. <laughs> So anyways, I would say that, you know what, we were basically looking at all the efficiencies because right now there was no efficiency when it came to the actual spending by the NDP. They were carelessly spending and the thing is we, were, we, we inherited a big mess. And I just hope that the Minister of Finance, what he's saying is actually going to be the, what is going to come true here. But, I, but the thing is they have a history of not providing fiscal responsibility. They cannot continue spending the money uh, that they have and, you know, Right now, we have you know hospitals. You know they closed in, in rural Manitoba. I know they came out. They did an announcement at, in Verdon when uh, the, the premier came out back in the spring, talking about announcement. And one of the, the CBC reporter Ian Price said to me, "Why were they doing an announcement in Verdon when 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 it actually they closed many ERs throughout uh, rural Manitoba in their days?" You know the member from, from Justice, uh, Minister of Justice, remembers that they closed 22 uh, hospitals. And the, mem the member for uh, Dauphin would also remember that too. They closed down uh, Grand View. They closed down Reston. They closed down Manitou. They closed down um, Boulder. They, sh they, they reduced uh, coverage. Um, you know, when they actually come, uh, uh, when it came to Boisevain, they reduced services there. All there is is a doctor, basically a clinic left there, uh, Honorable Speaker. So what I'm saying right now, Honorable Speaker, I, I want to make sure that in their budget, and you know, when it comes to uh, building sustainable communities to projects, I know the Minister of uh, Municipal Relations has actually to stop that that grant op op opportunities for a lot of municipalities here, and they're not ignoring a lot of the communities in um, throughout the province of Manitoba, and a lot of actually some of the projects within their own constituencies of Union Station. There's a project there. And so it's important that they can continue doing the, the good work that we have done and continue the fiscal responsibility. But, you know, they say the opposite. But you know what? I have they to say, I have to say, you know, Honorable Speaker, when it comes to their story, their narrative, that they're going to balance this budget at the end of their, their first term, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen because the fact is they'll go continue going on to their ways of um, mismanaging finances. Uh, the thing is, a lot of like a lot of, of them over there. Like they, uh, I don't have a lot of um, business um, background, and so I would say you know it's it concerns me. It concerns Manitobans when it comes to their tax dollars. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, is this not government money? It's people who pay their taxes. This is who we're, we need, they need to take responsibility for, is making sure that when we pay our taxes, when Manitobans pay taxes, they are going to ha have fiscal responsibility. In this case, when it came to the history of the NDP, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case when we inherited an $800 million deficit. And they say that we give them a fiscal mess when it came to $275 million surplus. That's the difference between an $800 million uh, deficit. So I don't know if they understand the difference between the, the numbers there, uh, Honorable Speaker. What, does, what is a deficit and what is a surplus? And so that concerns me. You know, I have, uh, you know, I have pride with my constituents that uh, when it comes to now making sure that they're accountable, I'm going to make sure that every single step of the way these next three and a half years that I'm going to make sure, especially when it comes to road construction, that they actually, especially in the next five years that we listed, every single project, these projects are going to get done. And that they're not going to take the money away that they did, like raid, raid and parade just before election. I, we're going to make sure that that money gets invested into our Manitoba highways because at the end of the day, some of the best 
opportunity for growth is actually job creation, making sure that when we invest in our highways, we get a lot of investment that comes back to this province. And you know, one thing that we did and that we had pride of is we had the Economic Community of Cabinet. And the thing was, Honorable Speaker, we brought a lot of interest and we brought a lot of business and a lot of money into this province for investment. And one of the examples is in Portage La Prairie, we brought Roquette, was a which one $1.3 billion project. And then when it came to Simplot, right next door, they put another $450 million of investment for expansion for potatoes. And the thing is, this is so important to Manitoba, is the infrastructure and in rural Manitoba to make sure that our produce and, and, and goods and services gets to the processing markets, gets to the cities, to make sure that it gets uh, intra-provincial transportation into other places where our goods and services go, Honourable Speaker. And it's so important right now, when it comes to Manitoba, we do have the trucking, we're, we're a heart of transportation. And I'm make, making sure that a lot of them, those items in the budget is basically invested in our highways. The perimeter highway was so much important for safety of Manitobans who are going to work and moving around the city of Winnipeg. If we don't invest into the city of Winnipeg, we're going to have a nightmare, much like a lot of cities had to spend extra money to make sure that, like Calgary, for instance, they, didn't, they had to make a major project in years later, and it cost them a lot more money to make sure that they can move traffic because the fact is they went beyond a million, now they're up to 1.5 million people within that region of Calgary. And uh, this is why we want to make sure that um, we, we, make, we want to make sure that this investment gets put into the infrastructure. We want to make sure that health care is also addressed too because the fact is they went out there and told them how bad health care was. Meanwhile, every other province was actually having the same issues of trying to find workers. Yeah, they can open up ERs in Winnipeg, reopen them like they said, but the thing is, where are they going to get the staff from? And the fact is, the thing is, what we were doing, we were getting Filipino nurses to come from the Philippines, and they have actually canceled the contract. We actually had 30 or 40 uh, Filipino nurses come into the Prairie Mountain Health region, which was really needed for health care. And I feel like in the past, this NDP government forgets rural Manitoba in a lot of cases too. And I'll make sure that I'm here for the next three and a half years is to make sure that we're never forgotten, much like we were back in the Salinger days. And like I said, we have a couple of colleagues here that remember that. And remember how there was a mass exodus of our young people going out of the province. And we were creating investments, we were creating um, projects that were gonna be coming here. And right now, the reason why we, we balanced our budget last year is because we focused on revenue. We uh, focused on economic development. And we brought that, that revenue in. And we had surplus for last year. And my concern is that they're already reversing a lot of that stuff that we have done when it came to attracting to have the advantage of having a better tax system here to compare us with Saskatchewan. I remember when I first became MLA, they raised the PST by 1%. Yeah. It didn't help communities like mine in Ver, uh, when it was in representing Verdon, Arthur Verdon or Melita. You know, we're so close to the border, or Boisevane, we're close to the US. A lot of that spending can be done in those other provinces because they have an advantage. And right now, uh, Musiman is growing quite largely because of uh, the, the policies they have, and, and Verdon was starting to grow. But when the NDP days, the population stagnant. We had an oil boom, and our population barely grew by 1%. Meanwhile, on the other side of the border, during the NDP days, the population grew from, the, from one census uh, to the other over 12% in Musiman. So this is why I feel that we are competing with Saskatchewan and other prairie provinces. And I just hope that, you know, when it comes to moving forward on these budgets that the NDP are going to perform, that they don't raise taxes because, again, that $3 billion that they promised during the election is going to make sure that it's the only way that they're going to pay for it, especially if they're not focusing on economic development, is raising of taxes. We saw them in the past. We saw them during the Pauli days. We saw them during the Salinger Dewar days. And I'm really concerned right now that, you know, as much as the Premier goes out and says, we're all rah, rah, you know, it, over time, that um, honeymoon is going to be over. And the other, no other choice to do the, the budget 
is going to have to raise taxes, honorable speaker. So on that note, I, I'm going to leave my words uh, to, on record here to, um, to say, you know, we are watching. We are watching to making sure that the NDP, are, we're going to, what they promised, a balanced budget by the end of the next term, I want to see that happen for the, for the betterment of Manitobans, to the ratepayers of Manitobans. So on that note, thank you, honorable speaker. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Thank you, uh, Honourable Deputy Speaker. It's an honour to rise again and speak to this very important uh, Interim Appropriation Act uh, we have uh, brought forward by his NDP government. And um, I, I understand I have 30 minutes to talk about this today, so I will, I will not use all of that time as uh, the Minister in Finance and I have spoken. But there are a couple of important things I do want to get on the record here uh, before we, <coughs> before we uh, call uh, just to vote here is this interim appropriation uh, act is, is important. It's for con con continuity, uh, so the government can continue to operate. Uh, we understand that on this side of the house, but there are some questions that the minister of finance has yet to answer, and uh, from his answers today, we will get those during the budget. Uh, and, and I look forward to seeing that because there are a lot of questions that Manitoba should have after listening to this. this is the, the, the one that jumps right out off the bat is. Um, in this act, this NDP government is asking for $14.8 billion. Uh, historic amounts, 14.8. Uh, previous government 2023 was $7.9 billion. Uh, that's almost double what they're asking for in this act. Um, when asked to speak to where that money is going to be spent, how it's going to happen, um, it's wait till the budget comes, wait till the budget comes, wait till the budget comes. So uh, we will wait till the budget comes. I asked the minister for show it early. He said he will not. Um, so we'll wait. Uh, the equalization payment by the federal government, $843 million. Uh, the largest ever 24% increase equalization payments. Manitobans have a right to know where that money is going. Um, that money should be going to make life more affordable, not to pay for irresponsible promises that were made under this, PC, uh, under this NDP government. Um, PCs left them in a surplus. Uh, now they say we're looking at a deficit from unaudited reports. Uh, MNP, uh, an accounting firm, anybody, whatever information you give them, the reports aren't going to be as good as that information you give them. This was unaudited. Uh, it was unverified. It was uh, completely based on the information the minister had given MNP. And of course, they're going to come out with the data that you give them. That's how they operate. They're not making up numbers. They're going off numbers only a one-sided uh, party gave them, uh, and that was this NDP party. When you uh, look at uh, other uh, expenses this province has uh, and these irresponsible promises made by this NDP government, uh, you see a, a $9.25 billion in order in council, largest order in council in recent history, $9.25 billion. And we're not even talking about the budget here. Uh, the minister wants to reference that this is for refinancing of debt maturity. Uh, how much of that is it? Couldn't get an answer. Uh, what are the payment terms on that? Couldn't get an answer. Uh, what are the payments going to be in a month or a year? Couldn't get an answer. $9.25 billion is no joke in this province. Uh, it's no joke for anyone. It's a serious number, and Manitobans have a right to know. When you look at previous historic spending by this uh, NDP party, it's no, it's, it shouldn't catch anyone by surprise. This NDP is known for increasing your taxes and doubling or tripling or quadrupling your debt. With their historic borrowing uh, from this Appropriation Act of $14.8 billion versus previous $7 billion, Manitobans should be worried about where this money is going. How is it going to be paid back? Who's going to pay it back? The minister couldn't answer those questions today. Hydro tripled their debt under this, under uh, some of the people who are here from NDP, uh, but under the NDP. Tripled their debt. 33 cents in every dollar goes to pay for your interest payments alone on your hydro, uh, on hydro's debt. How are they going to go forward in the future? We haven't had a plan yet. Fired the CEO a week before committee, so she couldn't answer, maybe. Um, minister comes out a week, says we disagree. She's fired the next week. Uh, the CEO and the board chair were uh, muzzled when it came to answering questions on this. Actually, they said that the performance of the former CEO was great, and they were happy with it. So it leads you to question, 
What is this NDP going to do with all this money? Why are they borrowing so much money right now? And let's not forget, this is the party that raised the PST after they said they won't raise the PST. And for his current, oh, that was a long time ago. This is the party that says they won't raise their taxes, and they already have raised school taxes. They have four schools to raise taxes. They talk about uh, tax cuts. The only tax cut they know is a fake tax crack, uh, cut. Sorry. A fake tax cut. That's what this government uh, is known for. They won't, they won't oppose their best friend, Justin Trudeau, when it comes to the carbon tax. They're in favor of raising the carbon tax on April 1st. Seven out of 10 premiers in Canada are saying that they should stop, that the carbon tax needs to be axed. This premier won't stand up. He won't even answer a question about it. They won't even answer a question on the carbon tax. They keep deflecting. That's how afraid they are of their best friend, Justin Trudeau. Manitobans have a right to know. Manitobans will know when this budget comes out that they are going to be in deep trouble with this NDP, and we're going to hold them accountable for that. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Are there any other members wishing to speak in debate? Hearing none, is the House ready for the question? The question before the House is concurrence and third reading of Bill No. 25, the Interim Appro Appropriation Act of 2024. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed and so ordered. The House will now prepare for royal assent. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. Division. The motion is passed on division. The House will now prepare for royal assent.
Marauder, Lieutenant Governor. Your Honor, the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba asks Your Honor to accept the following bill. Number 25, the Interim Appropriation Act 2024, Loi de 2024 portant affectation anticipée de crédit. In His Majesty's name, the Lieutenant Governor doth thank the Legislative Assembly and assent to this bill. The hour now being five o'clock, 
This House stands adjourned and is adjourned until Monday at 1.30.